13. Red Coast 3. Selected documents from the Red Coast project. These documents were declassified three years after Yao Xia told Wang Miao the inside story of Red Coast and provide background information for what she told him. 1. A question largely ignored by trends in fundamental world scientific research. Originally published in Internal Reference, XX slash XX slash 196 X. Abstract. Based on modern and contemporary history, there are two ways in which the results of fundamental scientific research can be converted into practical applications, gradualistic mode and saltatory mode. Gradualistic mode, theoretical fundamental results are gradually applied to technology, advances accumulate until they reach a breakthrough. Recent examples include the development of space technology. Saltatory mode. Theoretical fundamental results rapidly become applied technology, leading to a technological leap. Recent examples include the appearance of atomic weapons. Until the 40s, some of the foremost physicists still thought it would never be possible to release the energy of the atom. But atomic weapons then appeared within a very short period. We define a technology leap to occur when fundamental science is converted to applied technology across a great span in an extremely brief time interval. Currently both NATO and the Warsaw Pact are intensely active in fundamental research and investing heavily in it. One or more technological leaps can occur at any time. Such an occurrence will pose a major threat to our strategic planning. This article argues that our focus is currently on the gradualistic mode of technology development, and insufficient attention is paid to the possibility of technology leaps. Starting from a higher vantage point, we should develop a comprehensive strategy and set of principles, so that we can respond appropriately when technological leaps occur. Fields where technological leaps are most likely. Physics. Omitted. Biology. Omitted. Computer science. Omitted. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence, SETI. Of all fields, this is the one in which the possibility for a technology leap is greatest. If a leap occurs in this field, the impact will exceed the sum of technology leaps in the other three fields. Full text, omitted. Instructions from central leadership. Distribute this article to appropriate personnel and organize discussion groups. The article's views will not be to the liking of some, but let's not rush to label the author. The key is to appreciate the author's long-term thinking. Some comrades cannot see beyond the ends of their noses, possibly because of the greater political environment, possibly because of their arrogance. This is not good. Strategic blind spots are extremely dangerous. In my view, of the four fields where technology leaps may occur, we have given the least thought to the last one. It's worth some attention, and we should systematically analyze the matter in depth. Signed, XXX. Date, XX slash XX slash 196X. 2. Research report on the possibility of technology leap due to the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. 1. Current International Research Trends Summary 1. The United States and other NATO states, the scientific case and the necessity for SETI are generally accepted, and strong academic support exists. Project Ozma In 1960, the National Radio Astronomy Observatory at Green Bank, West Virginia, searched for extraterrestrial intelligence with a radio telescope 26 meters in diameter. The project examined the stars Tau Ceti and Epsilon Eridni for 200 hours using ranges near the 1.420 GHz frequency. Yeah. Project Ozma 2, which will involve more targets and a broader frequency range, is planned for 1972. Yeah. Probes The Pioneer 10 and Pioneer 11 probes, each of which will carry a metal plaque containing information about civilization on Earth, are scheduled for launch in 1972. The Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 probes, each of which will carry a metal audio record, are scheduled for launch in 1977. The Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico, constructed in 1963, this is an important instrument for SETI. Its effective energy collection area is about 20 acres, which is greater than the sum of the collecting areas of all other radio telescopes in the world. When combined with its computer system, it can simultaneously monitor 65,000 channels, and is also capable of ultra-high energy transmissions. 2. The Soviet Union 
Few sources of intelligence are available, but there are indications that large investments have been made in the field. Compared to NATO countries, the research seems to be more systematic and long-term. Based on certain isolated information channels, plans are currently underway to build a global-scale, very long baseline interferometry VLBI, Aperture Synthesis Radio Telescope System. Once the system is completed, it will possess the world's most powerful deep space exploration capabilities. 2. Preliminary analysis of social patterns of extraterrestrial civilizations using a materialist conception of history. Omitted. 3. Preliminary analysis of the influence of extraterrestrial civilizations on human social and political trends. Omitted. 4. Preliminary analysis of the influence on current international patterns due to possible contact with extraterrestrial civilizations. 1. Unidirectional contact. Only receiving messages sent by extraterrestrial intelligence. Omitted. 2. Bidirectional contact. Exchange of messages with extraterrestrial intelligence and direct contact. Omitted. 5. The danger and consequences of superpowers making initial contact with extraterrestrial intelligence and monopolizing such contact. 1. Analysis of consequences of American imperialists and NATO making initial contact with extraterrestrial intelligence and monopolizing such contact. Still classify. 2. Analysis of consequences of Soviet revisionists and Warsaw Pact making initial contact with extraterrestrial intelligence and monopolizing such contact still classified instructions from central leadership others have already sent their messages out into space it's dangerous if extraterrestrials only hear their voices we should speak up as well only then will they get a complete picture of human society it's not possible to get the truth by only listening to one side we must make this happen and quickly Signed, XXX, date, XX slash XX slash 196X. 3. Research report on the initial phase of the Red Coast project. XX slash XX slash 196X. Top secret. Number of copies, 2. Summary document. Central document number XXXXXX forwarded to the Commission for Science, Technology and Industry for National Defense, the Chinese Academy of Sciences and the Central Planning Commission, Department of National Defense. Disseminated at the XXXXXX conference and the XXXXXX conference. Partially disseminated at the XXXXXX conference. Topic serial number 3760. Code name: Red Coast. 1. Goal. Summary to search for the possible existence of extraterrestrial intelligence and to attempt contact and exchange. 2. Theoretical study of the Red Coast project. 1. Searching and monitoring. Monitoring frequency range 1000 MHz to 40,000 MHz. Monitoring channels 15,000. Key frequencies to monitor. Hydrogen atom frequency at 1420 MHz. Hydroxyl radical radiation frequency at 1,667 MHz. Water molecule radiation frequency at 22,000 MHz. Monitoring target range, a sphere centered around Earth with a radius of 1,000 light years, containing approximately 20 million stars. For a list of targets, please see Appendix 1. 2. Message transmission. Transmission frequencies, 2,800 MHz, 12,000 MHz, 22,000 MHz. Transmission power. 10 to 25 megawatts. Transmission targets, a sphere centered around Earth with a radius of 200 light years, containing approximately 100,000 stars. For a list of targets, please see Appendix 2. 3. Development of the Red Coast Self-Interpreting Code System. Guiding Principle. Using universal basic mathematical and physical laws, construct an elemental linguistic code that can be understood by any civilization that has mastered basic algebra, Euclidean geometry, and the laws of classical mechanics, non-relativistic physics. Using the elemental code above and supplemented with low-resolution images, gradually build up to a full linguistic system. Languages supported, Chinese and Esperanto. The entire system's information content should be 680 kilobytes. Transmission times at the 2,800 MHz, 12,000 MHz and 22,000 MHz channels are 1,183 minutes, 224 minutes and 132 minutes, respectively. 3. Implementation Plan for the Red Coast Project. 
1. Preliminary design for the Red Coast Monitoring and Searching System, still classified. 2. Preliminary design for the Red Coast Transmission System, still classified. 3. Preliminary site selection plan for Red Coast Base, omitted. 4. Preliminary thoughts on the formation of Red Coast Force from within the 2nd Artillery Corps, still classified. 4. Content of message transmitted by Red Coast. Summary. Overview of Earth, 3.1 kilobytes. Overview of life on Earth, 4.4 kilobytes. Overview of human society, 4.6 kilobytes. Basic world history, 5.4 kilobytes. Total information content, 17.5 kilobytes. The entire message will be sent after transmitting the self-interpreting code system. Transmission times of message at the 2800 MHz, 12000 MHz and 22000 MHz channels are 31 minutes, 7.5 minutes and 3.5 minutes respectively. The message will be carefully vetted by a multidisciplinary review to ensure that it will not give away the Earth's coordinates relative to the Milky Way. Among the three channels, transmission at the higher frequency 12,000 MHz and 22,000 MHz channels should be minimized to reduce the likelihood that the source of transmission may be precisely ascertained. 4. Message to Extraterrestrial Civilizations First Draft Complete Text Attention you who have received this message. This message was sent out by a country that represents revolutionary justice on Earth. Before this, you may have already received other messages sent from the same direction. Those messages were sent by an imperialist superpower on this planet. That superpower is struggling against another superpower for world domination, so that it can drag human history backwards. We hope you will not listen to their lies. Stand with justice. Stand with the revolution. Instructions from Central Leadership this is utter crap. It's enough to put up big character posters everywhere on the ground, but we should not send them into space. The Cultural Revolution leadership should no longer have any involvement with Red Coast. Such an important message must be composed carefully. It's probably best to have it drafted by a special committee, and then discussed and approved by a meeting of the Politburo. Signed, XXX, date, XX slash XX slash 196X, second draft. Omitted. Third draft. Omitted. Fourth draft. Complete text. We extend our best wishes to you, inhabitants of another world. After reading the following message, you should have a basic understanding of civilization on Earth. By dint of long toil and creativity, the human race has built a splendid civilization, blossoming with a multitude of diverse cultures. We've also begun to understand the laws governing the natural world and the development of human societies. We cherish all that we have accomplished. But our world is still flawed. Hate exists, as does prejudice and war. Because of conflicts between the forces of production and the relations of production, wealth distribution is extremely uneven. And large portions of humanity live in poverty and misery. Human societies are working hard to resolve the difficulties and problems they face, striving to create a better future for Earth civilization. The country that sent this message is engaged in this effort. We are dedicated to building an ideal society, where the labor and value of every member of the human race are fully respected, where everyone's material and spiritual needs are fully met, so that civilization on Earth may become more perfect. With the best of intentions, we look forward to establishing contact with other civilized societies in the universe. We look forward to working together with you to build a better life in this vast universe. 5. Related Policies and Strategies 1. Consideration of policies and strategies after reception of message from extraterrestrial intelligence. Omitted. 2. Consideration of policies and strategies after establishing contact with extraterrestrial intelligence. Omitted. Instructions from Central Leadership. It's important to take the time out of our busy schedules to do something entirely unrelated to our immediate needs. This project has allowed us to give some thought to issues we've never had time for. Indeed, we can think through them only when we take a sufficiently high vantage point. This alone is enough to justify the Red Coast project. How wonderful it will be if the universe really contains other intelligences and other societies. Bystanders have the clearest view. 
someone truly neutral will then be able to comment on whether we're the heroes or villains of history. Sign, XXX, date, XX slash XX slash 196X. 14. Red Coast 4. Professor Ye? Wong Miao said. I have a question. Back then, SETI was marginalized research. Why did the Red Coast project have such a high security rating? That question was asked during the very first phases of the Red Coast project, and continued to be asked until the end. But now you should know the answer. We can only be impressed by the foresight of the top decision maker responsible for the Red Coast project. Yes, he thought far ahead. Wong nodded gravely. Wong knew that it was only within the last couple of years that serious and systematic consideration had been given to the question of how and to what degree human societies would be influenced by establishing contact with extraterrestrial intelligence. But the research had rapidly gained interest, and the conclusions were shocking. Naive, idealistic hopes had been shattered. Scholars found that contrary to the happy wishes of most people, it was not a good idea for the human race as a whole to make contact with extraterrestrials. The impact of such contact on human society would be divisive, rather than uniting, and would exacerbate rather than mitigate the conflicts between different cultures. In summary, if contact were to occur, the internal divisions within Earth civilization would be magnified and likely lead to disaster. The most shocking conclusion of all was that the impact would have nothing at all to do with the degree and type of contact, unidirectional or bidirectional, or the form and degree of advancement of the alien civilization. This was the theory of contact as symbol proposed by sociologist Bill Mathers of Rand Corporation in his book The 100,000 Light Year Iron Curtain, SETI Sociology. Mathers believed the contact with an alien civilization is only a symbol or a switch. Regardless of the content of the encounter, the results would be the same. Suppose that the nature of the contact is such that only the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence is confirmed, with no other substantive information, what Mathers called elementary contact. The impact would be magnified by the lens of human mass psychology and culture until it resulted in huge substantive influences on the progress of civilization. If such contact were monopolized by one country or political force, the significance would be comparable to an overwhelming advantage in economic and military power. How did Red Coast end? You can probably guess. Wong nodded again. Of course he understood that had Red Coast succeeded, the world today would be very different. To comfort yeah, he said, it's still too early to tell if it succeeded or not. The radio waves sent out by Red Coast haven't gone very far in the universe yet. Yeah shook her head. The farther the signals travel, the weaker they become, and the less likely that any extraterrestrial civilization will receive them. Of course, if aliens have already detected the Earth's existence and its oxygen-rich atmosphere, and decided to focus powerful equipment specifically at us, the story would be different. But in general, research shows that in order for extraterrestrials to detect our signals, we must broadcast at a power level equal to the energy output of a mid-sized star. Soviet astrophysicist Nikolai Kardashev once proposed that civilizations can be divided into three types based on the power they can command. For communication purposes, let's say. A type 1 civilization can muster an amount of energy equivalent to the total energy output of the Earth. Based on his estimates, the energy output of the Earth is about 10 to the 15th power to 10 to the 16th power watts. A Type 2 civilization can marshal the energy equivalent to the output of a typical star, 10 to the 26th power watts. A Type 3 civilization's communication energy can reach 10 to the 36th power watts, approximately equal to the energy output of a galaxy. Civilization on Earth is currently about a Type 0.7, not even a full type 1, and the transmissions from Red Coast used only about one ten millionth of the amount of power the Earth could muster. Our call was like the buzzing of a mosquito in the sky. No one could hear it. 
But if Kardashev's Type 2 and Type 3 civilizations really exist, we should be able to hear them? We never heard anything during the 20 years that Red Coast was in operation. Indeed, given Red Coast and SETI, could all our efforts ultimately have proven only one thing? In the entire universe only the Earth has intelligent life? Yeah, gave a light sigh. Theoretically, there may never be a definitive answer to that question. But my sense, and the sense of everyone who went through Red Coast, is that that is the case. It's too bad that Red Coast was decommissioned. Once it was built, it should have been kept running. It was a truly great enterprise. Red Coast's decline was gradual. At the beginning of the 80s, there was a large-scale renovation. Mainly, the transmission and monitoring computer systems were partially upgraded. The transmission system was automated, and the monitoring system incorporated two IBM mini-computers. The data processing capability became far more advanced, and it was able to simultaneously monitor 40,000 channels. But later, as people gained perspective, they had a better appreciation of the difficulty of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and the leadership lost interest in Red Coast. The first change was reducing the base's security rating. The consensus was that the extreme secrecy around Red Coast was unnecessary, and the security detail at the base was reduced from a company to a squad, until eventually only a group of five security guards were left. Also, after that renovation, although Red Coast remained administratively within the Second Artillery Corps, management of its scientific activities was turned over to the Chinese Academy of Sciences Astronomy Institute, and it took on some research projects that had nothing to do with the search for extraterrestrial intelligence or the military. I believe you achieved most of your scientific accomplishments during that time. Initially, Red Coast also took on some radio astronomy projects. At the time, it was the largest radio telescope in the country. Later, as other radio astronomy observatories were built, Red Coast's research turned to the observation and analysis of solar electromagnetic activity. For this, they added a solar telescope. The mathematical model we built for solar electromagnetic activity was at the forefront of the field back then, and had many practical applications. With these later research results, the large amount invested in Red Coast had at least a little return. Actually, much of the credit should be given to Commissar Lay. Of course, he had his own agenda. He realized that as a political officer in a technical unit, his future wasn't bright. Before joining the army, he had studied astrophysics as well, so he wanted to return to doing science. The research projects that Red Coast took on outside of the search for extraterrestrial intelligence were all due to his efforts. I doubt that he could have returned to technical work so easily after spending so much time as a political commissar. Back then you still hadn't been politically rehabilitated. It looks to me like all he did was to put his name on your research results. Yeah, smiled forgivingly. Without Lay, Red Coast Base would have been finished even earlier. After Red Coast was designated for conversion to civilian use, the military basically abandoned it. Eventually, the Chinese Academy of Sciences couldn't maintain the funds necessary for Red Coast's operation, and it was shut down. Ya yeah, didn't talk much about her daily life at Red Coast base, and Wong didn't ask. Four years after entering the base, she married Yang Wining. Everything just happened naturally, without any drama. Later, an accident at the base killed both Yang and Lei, and Yang Dong was born after her father's death. The mother and daughter only left Radar Peak in the mid-80s, when Red Coast Base was finally decommissioned. Ya later returned to Singhla, her alma mater, to teach astrophysics until retirement. All this Wong had heard from Shah Rushan at the Miyun Radio Astronomy Observatory. The search for extraterrestrial intelligence is a unique discipline. It has a profound influence on the researcher's perspective on life. Yeah, spoke in a drawn-out voice, as though telling stories to a child. In the dead of the night, I could hear in my headphones the lifeless noise of the universe. The noise was faint, but constant. More eternal than the stars. Sometimes I thought it sounded like the endless winter winds of the greater Kingan Mountains. I felt so cold then, and the loneliness was indescribable. 
From time to time, I would gaze up at the stars after a night shift, and think that they looked like a glowing desert. And I myself was a poor child abandoned in the desert. I thought that life was truly an accident among accidents in the universe. The universe was an empty palace, and humankind, the only ants in the entire palace. This kind of thinking infused the second half of my life with a conflicted mentality. Sometimes I thought life was precious, and everything was so important. But other times I thought humans were insignificant, and nothing was worthwhile. Anyway, my life passed day after day, accompanied by this strange feeling. Before I knew it, I was old. Ong wanted to comfort this old woman who had devoted her life to a lonely but great enterprise. But Yaz's last speech caused him to sink into the same sorrowful mood. He found that he had nothing to say, except, Professor Ya, someday I'll go with you to visit the ruins of Red Coast Space. Ya slowly shook her head. Xiao Wang, I'm not like you. I'm getting on in years, and my health isn't what it used to be. It's hard to predict the future. I live my life day to day. Looking at the silvery head of hair on Ya Wins Ya, Wang knew she was thinking of her daughter again. 15. Three Body, Copernicus, Universal Football, and Tri Solar Day. After leaving Ya's home, Wang Miao couldn't calm down. The events of the last two days and the history of Red Coast, two seemingly unconnected strands, now twisted together, made the world unfamiliar overnight. Once he was home, in order to escape this mood, Wong turned on the computer, put on the V-suit, and logged on to Three Body for the third time. The attempt to adjust his state of mind worked. By the time the login screen appeared, Wong seemed like a different person, one filled with an unexplainable excitement. Unlike the first two times, this time Wong came with a purpose. He was going to reveal the secret of the world of Three Body. He created a new login ID appropriate for his new role. Copernicus. Once logged in, Wong again stood on that broad, desolate plain, facing the strange dawn of the world of Three Body. A colossal pyramid appeared in the east, but right away Wong knew it was no longer the pyramid of King Zhou of Shang, or Matza. It had a Gothic-style apex, stabbing straight into the morning sky, recalling St. Joseph's Church at Wong Futsin. But if that church were placed next to this pyramid, it would be nothing more than an entrance booth. He saw many buildings in the distance that were apparently dehydratories, but also now built in a Gothic style, with tall sharp steeples, as though the ground had grown numerous spikes. Wong saw a door on the side of the pyramid, lit from within by flickering lights. He walked over. Inside the tunnel was a row of statues of the gods of Olympus holding up torches, their surfaces blackened by smoke. He entered the great hall and saw that it was even dimmer than the entrance tunnel. Yeah. Two silver candelabra on top of a long marble table provided a drowsy light. Yeah. Several men were seated around the table. The dim light allowed Wong to see only the outlines of their faces. Their eyes were hidden in the shadows of their deep eye sockets, but Wong could still feel their gazes focusing on him. The men seemed to be dressed in medieval robes. On closer examination, one or two of them had simpler robes, more like classical Greek chitons. At one end of the table was a thin, tall man. The golden crown on top of his head was the only thing that glittered in the great hall, other than the candles. With some effort, Wong saw by the dim candlelight that his robe was different from the others. It was red. Wong realized that the game displayed a distinct world for each player. This world, based on the European High Middle Ages, was chosen by the software based on his ID. You're late. The meeting has been going on for a while, the gold-crowned red-robed man said. I'm Pope Gregory. Wong tried to recall what little he knew of European history in the Middle Ages, so that he could deduce the level of advancement of this civilization based on the name. But then he remembered how wildly anachronistic historical references could be in the world of free body, and decided the effort wasn't worth it. I'm Aristotle. You changed your ID, but we all recognize you. In the previous two civilizations, you traveled to the east. The speaker was the man with the Greek chiton. He had a head of white curls. 
Yes, Wong nodded. There I witnessed the destruction of two civilizations, one by extreme cold, another by a blazing sun. I also saw the great efforts the scholars of the East expended in trying to master the laws governing the sun's motion. <laughs> the sound came from a man with a goatee that curled upward. He was even thinner than the Pope. Eastern scholars tried to understand the secrets of the sun's motion through meditation, epiphany, or even dreams. Utterly laughable. This is Galileo, said Aristotle. He advocates understanding the world through observation and experiment. He is an unimaginative thinker, but his results demand our attention. But uh, also conducted experiments and observation, Wong said. Galileo snorted. Watts's way of thinking was still Eastern. He was nothing more than a mystic dressed as a scientist. He never took his own observation data seriously, and he constructed his model based on subjective speculation. Ridiculous. I feel sorry for his refined equipment. We're different. Based on large amounts of observational data and experiments, we make strict, logical deductions to build a model of the universe. Then we go back to experimentation and observation to test it. That's correct, Wong nodded. That's also my way of thinking. Have you brought a calendar as well, then? The Pope's tone was mocking. I don't have a calendar. I only brought a model built upon observation data. But I must make it clear that even if the model is correct, it's not certain that by using it one can master the precise details of the sun's motion and create a calendar. However, it's a necessary step. A few lonely claps echoed throughout the Great Hall. The applause came from Galileo. Excellent, Copernicus. Excellent. Your pragmatic way of thinking, adapted to the experimental scientific approach, is lacking in most scholars. Based on this alone, your theory is worth listening to. The Pope nodded at Wong. Go ahead. After calming himself and walking to the other end of the long table, Wong said, It's actually pretty simple. The reason why the sun's motion seems patternless is because our world has three suns. Under the influence of their mutually perturbing gravitational attraction, their movements are unpredictable. The three-body problem. When our planet revolves around one of the suns in a stable orbit, that's a stable era. When one or more of the other suns move within a certain distance, their gravitational pull will snatch the planet away from the sun it's orbiting, causing it to wander unstably through the gravitational fields of the three suns. That's a chaotic era. After an uncertain amount of time, our planet is once again pulled into a temporary orbit and another stable era begins. This is a football game at the scale of the universe. The players are the three suns, and our planet is the football. A few hollow laughs rang out in the Great Hall. Burn him to death, the Pope said impassively. The two soldiers standing at the door in rusty armor started toward Wong like two clumsy robots. Burn him, Galileo sighed. I had hopes for you, but you're nothing more than another mystic or warlock. Such men are a public nuisance, Aristotle agreed. At least let me finish. Wong shoved away the iron gauntlets of the two soldiers. Have you seen three sons, or know anyone who has? Galileo asked. Everyone has seen them. Then, other than the sun that appears during chaotic eras and stable eras, where are the other two? The sun that we see at different times may not be the same. It's only one of the three suns. When the other two are far away, they look like flying stars. Mm. You lack basic scientific training, Galileo said, shaking his head. The sun must move continuously to a distant spot. It cannot jump over the intervening space. According to your hypothesis, there should be another observable situation. The sun must get smaller than it usually appears, but bigger than a flying star, and gradually shrink into a flying star as it moves farther away. But we've never seen the sun behave that way. Since you have scientific training, you ought to have some knowledge of the sun's structure. That's my proudest discovery. The sun is made of a sparse but expansive gaseous outer layer and a dense and hot inner core. Very true, said Wong. 
but you apparently haven't discovered the special optical interaction between the sun's gaseous outer layer and our planet's atmosphere. It's a phenomenon akin to polarization or destructive interference. As a result, when we view the sun from within our atmosphere and it gets a certain distance from us, the gaseous outer layer suddenly becomes completely transparent and invisible, and all we can see is its bright inner core. The sun then appears to be only the size of the inner core, a flying star. Uh, th this phenomenon has confused every researcher and every civilization throughout history and prevented them from discovering the existence of the three suns. Now you understand why the appearance of three flying stars heralds a long period of extreme cold, because all three suns are far away. A brief silence followed as everyone pondered this. Aristotle was the first to speak. You lack basic training in logic. It's true that we can sometimes see three flying stars, and that's always accompanied by destructive periods of extreme cold. But based on your theory, we should also sometimes see three normal-sized suns in the sky. This has never happened. In all the records of all the civilizations, this has never occurred. Wait. A man wearing a strangely shaped hat and a long beard stood up and spoke for the first time. I'm Leonardo da Vinci. There may be such historical records. One civilization saw two suns and was immediately destroyed by their combined heat. But the record was very vague. We're talking about three suns, not two. Galileo shouted. According to his theory, three suns must appear sometime, just like three flying stars. Three suns half appeared, Wong said, utterly calm. And people have seen them. But those who saw such a great sight could not leave behind any information about them, because seeing three suns would mean that they had at most a few seconds left to live. They had no chance to escape or survive. Tri-solar days are the most terrifying catastrophes for our world. On such days, the surface of the planet would turn into a smelting furnace in a second, and the heat would be enough to melt rocks. After the destruction caused by a tri-solar day, an eon would pass before the reappearance of life and civilization. This is yet another reason why there's no historical record of them. Silence. Everyone stared at the Pope. Earn him. The Pope said gently. The smile on his face was a little familiar to Wong. The smile of King Zhou of Shang. The Great Hall came alive, and everyone seemed to be preparing for a celebration. Galileo and some others joyfully carried a stake out of a dark corner. They pulled off the charcoal black body still tied to the stake and cast it aside before fastening it in an upright position. Another group happily piled firewood around the stake. Only Leonardo ignored the commotion. He sat at the table, pondering, and occasionally using a pen to calculate something on the table. Giordano Bruno, Aristotle said, pointing at the blackened body. Like you, he came here and spewed nonsense. Use a low fire, the Pope said, his voice weak. Two soldiers started to tie Wong Miao to the stake using asbestos ropes. Wong used the hand that was still free to point at the Pope. You are nothing more than a program. As for the rest of you, you're either programs or idiots. I will log back on. You cannot return. You will disappear forever from the world of three body. Galileo cackled. Then you must be a program. A normal person would certainly understand the basics of the internet. The most the game can do is record my MAC address. I can just switch computers and create a new ID. I'll announce myself when I'm back. The system has recorded your retinal scan through the V-suit, Leonardo said, looking up at Wong. Then he returned to his calculations. Wong Miao was seized by a nameless terror. He shouted, don't do this, let me go, I'm telling the truth. Huh? If you're telling the truth, then you won't be burnt to death. The game rewards those who are on the right path. As Aristotle grinned, he took out a silver Zippo lighter, flipped it in his hand in a complicated fashion, and then flicked it on. As he was about to light the firewood piled around Wong, 
A bright red light filled the entrance tunnel, followed by a wave of heat and smoke. A horse dashed out of the light and into the great hole. Its body was already on fire, and as it galloped, the wind whipped it into a ball of flames. The rider, a knight in heavy armor that glowed red from the heat, dragged a line of white smoke behind him. The world has ended, the world has ended, dehydrate, dehydrate! As the knight shouted, the animal under him fell down and turned into a bonfire. The knight was thrown some distance and rolled all the way to the state, where he stopped moving. White smoke continued to pour out of openings in the armor. The sizzling breeze from the dead man inside oozed out on the ground and caught fire, giving the armor a pair of burning wings. Everyone in the great hall streamed toward the entrance tunnel and squeezed into it, disappearing in the red light from outside. Wang Miao struggled with all his strength, until he was freed from the ropes. He dodged the burning knight and horse, dashed through the empty great hall and ran down the sweltering tunnel until he emerged outside. The ground glowed red like a piece of iron in a blacksmith's furnace. Bright rivulets of lava snaked across the dim red earth, forming a net of fire that stretched to the horizon. Countless thin pillars of flame erupted toward the sky. The dehydratories were burning. The dehydrated bodies inside gave the fire a strange, bluish glow. Not far from him, Wan saw a dozen or so small pillars of flame of the same color. These were the people who had just run out of the pyramid, the Pope, Galileo, Aristotle and Leonardo. The fiery pillars around them were translucent blue, and he could see their faces and bodies slowly deforming in the flame. They focused their gazes on Wong, who had just emerged. Holding the same pose and lifting their arms toward the sky, they chanted in unison. Tri-Solar Day! Wong looked up and saw three gigantic suns slowly spinning around an invisible orotum, like an immense three-bladed fan blowing a deadly wind toward the world below. The three suns took up almost the entire sky, and as they drifted toward the west, half of the formation sank below the horizon. The giant fan continued to spin, a bright blade occasionally shooting above the horizon to give the dying world another brief sunrise and sunset. After a sunset, the ground glowed dim red, and the sunrise a moment later flooded everything with its glaring parallel rays. Once the three suns had completely set, the thick clouds that had formed from all the evaporated water still reflected their glow. The sky burned, displaying a hellish, maddening beauty. After the last light of destruction finally disappeared, and the clouds only glowed with a faint red luminescence reflected from the hellish fire on the ground, a few lines of giant text appeared. Civilization number 183 was destroyed by a tri-solar day. This civilization had advanced to the Middle Ages. After a long time, life and civilization will begin again, and progress once more through the unpredictable world of three-body. But in this civilization, Copernicus successfully revealed the basic structure of the universe. The civilization of three body will take its first leap. The game has now entered the second level. We invite you to log on to the second level of three body. 16. The three body problem. As soon as Wong logged out of the game, the phone rang. It was Shu Chang who said it was urgent that he come down to Shu's office at the criminal division. Wang glanced at his watch. It was three in the morning. Wang arrived at Dai Shu's chaotic office and saw that it was already filled with a dense cloud of cigarette smoke. A young woman police officer who shared the office fanned the smoke away from her nose with the notebook. Da Shu introduced her as Shu Bing Bing, a computer specialist from the Information Security Division. The third person in the office surprised Wang. It was Wei Cheng, the reclusive, mysterious husband of Shen Yufei from the frontiers of science. Wei's hair was a mess. He looked up at Wang, but seemed to have forgotten they had met. I'm sorry to bother you, but at least it looks like you weren't asleep, Da Xiu said. I have to deal with something that I haven't told the battle command center yet, and I need your advice. He turned to Wei Cheng. Tell him what you told me. My life is in danger, Wei said, his face wooden. Why don't you start from the beginning? Fine, I will. Don't complain about me being long-winded. Actually, 
I've often thought about talking to someone lately. Wei turned to look at Shu Bing Bing. Don't you need to take notes or something? Not right now, Dasha said, not missing a beat. You didn't have anyone to talk to before? No, that's not it. I was too lazy to talk. I've always been lazy. Wei Chang's story. I've been like a day school since I was a kid. When I lived at boarding school, I never washed the dishes or made the bed. I never got excited about anything. Too lazy to study, too lazy to even play. I dawdled my way through the days without any clear goals. But I knew that I had some special talents others lacked. For example, if you drew a line, I could always draw another line that would divide it into the golden ratio, 1.618. My classmates told me that I should be a carpenter, but I thought it was more than that. A kind of intuition about numbers and shapes. But my math grades were just as bad as my grades in other classes. I was too lazy to bother showing my work. On tests, I just wrote out my guesses as answers. I got them right about 80-90% to 90 of the time, but I still got mediocre scores. When I was a second-year student in high school, a math teacher noticed me. Back then, many high school teachers had impressive academic credentials, because during the Cultural Revolution, many talented scholars ended up teaching in high schools. My teacher was like that. One day, he kept me after class. He wrote out a dozen or so numerical sequences on the blackboard and asked me to write out the summation formula for each. I wrote out the formulas for some of them almost instantaneously and could tell at a glance that the rest of them were divergent. My teacher took out a book, The Collected Cases of Sherlock Holmes. He turned to one story, a study in Scarlet, I think. There's a scene in it where Watson sees a plainly dressed messenger downstairs and points him out to Holmes. Holmes says, oh, you mean the retired sergeant of Marines? Watson is amazed by how Holmes could deduce the man's history. But Holmes can't articulate his reasoning and has to think for a while to figure out his chain of deductions. It was based on the man's hand, his movements, and so on. He tells Watson that there's nothing strange about this. Most people have difficulty explaining how they know two and two make four. <clears throat> My teacher closed the book and said to me, You're just like that. Your derivation is so fast and instinctive that you can't even tell how you got the answer. Now he asked me, when you see a string of numbers, what do you feel? I'm talking about feelings. I said, any combination of numbers appears to me as a three-dimensional shape. Of course, I can't describe the shapes of numbers, but they really do appear as shapes. Then what about when you see geometric figures? The teacher asked. I said, it is just the opposite. In my mind, there are no geometric figures. Everything turns into numbers. It's just like if you get really close to a picture in the newspaper and everything turns into little dots. The teacher said, you really have a natural gift for math, but, but, he added a few more buts, pacing back and forth, as though I was a difficult problem that he didn't know how to handle. But, people like you don't cherish your gift. After thinking for a while, he seemed to give up, saying, why don't you sign up for the district math competition next month? I'm not going to tutor you, I'd just be wasting my time with your sort. But when you give your answers, make sure to write out your derivations. So... And I went to the competition, from the district level up through the International Mathematics Olympiad in Budapest. I won first place each time. After I got back, I was accepted by a top of college's math program without having to go through the entrance examination. You're not bored by my talking all this time? Yeah, good. Well, to make sense of what happened later, I have to tell you all this. That high school math teacher was right. I didn't cherish my talent. Bachelor's, Master's, Ph.D., I never put much effort into any of them. But I did manage to get through them all. However, once I graduated and went back to the real world, I realized that I was completely useless. Other than math, I knew nothing. I was half asleep when it came to the complexities of relationships between people. The longer I worked, the worse my career. Eventually, I became a lecturer at a college, but I couldn't survive there either. I just couldn't take teaching seriously. I write on the blackboard, easy to prove, and my students would still struggle for a long while. Later, when they began to eliminate the worst teachers, I was fired. By then, I was sick of everything. I packed a bag and went to a Buddhist temple deep in the mountains, somewhere in southern China. Oh, I didn't go to become a monk. I'm too lazy for that. I just wanted to find a truly peaceful place to live for a while. 
The abbot there was my father's old friend, very intellectual but became a monk in his old age. The way my father told it, at his level, this is about the only way out. The abbot asked me to stay. I told him, I want to find a peaceful, easy way to just muddle through the rest of my life. The abbot said, this place isn't really peaceful. There are a lot of tourists, and many pilgrims too. The truly peaceful can find peace in a bustling city. And to attain that state, you need to empty yourself. I said, I'm empty enough. Fame and fortune are nothing to me. Many of the monks in this temple are worldlier than me. The abbot shook his head and said, no, emptiness is not nothingness. Emptiness is a type of existence. You must use this existential emptiness to fill yourself. Those words were very enlightening to me. Later, after I thought about it a bit, I realized that it wasn't Buddhist philosophy at all, but was more akin to some modern physics theories. The abbot also told me he wasn't going to discuss Buddhism with me. His reason was the same as my high school teachers. With my sort, he'd just be wasting his time. That first night, I couldn't sleep in the tiny room in the temple. I didn't realize that this refuge from the world would be so uncomfortable. My blanket and sheet both became damp in the mountain fog, and the bed was so hard. In order to make myself sleep, I tried to follow the abbot's advice and fill myself with emptiness. In my mind, the first emptiness I created was the infinity of space. There was nothing in it, not even light. But soon I knew that this empty universe could not make me feel peace. Instead, it filled me with a nameless anxiety, like a drowning man wanting to grab onto anything at hand. So I created a sphere in this infinite space for myself. Not too big, though possessing mass. My mental state didn't improve, however. The sphere floated in the middle of emptiness. In infinite space, anywhere could be the middle. The universe had nothing that could act on it, and it could act on nothing. It hung there, never moving, never changing, like a perfect interpretation for death. I created a second sphere whose mass was equal to the first ones. Both had perfectly reflective surfaces. They reflected each other's images, displaying the only existence in the universe other than itself. But the situation didn't improve much. If the spheres had no initial movement, uh, that is if I didn't push them at first, they would be quickly pulled together by their own gravitational attraction. Then the two spheres would stay together and hang there without moving, a symbol for death. If they did have initial movement and didn't collide, then they would revolve around each other under the influence of gravity. No matter what the initial conditions, the revolutions would eventually stabilize and become unchanging the dance of death. I then introduced a third sphere, and to my astonishment, the situation changed completely. Like I said, any geometric figure turns into numbers in the depths of my mind. The spheres, one sphere and two sphere universes all showed up as a single equation, or a few equations, like a few lonesome leaves in late fall. But this third sphere gave emptiness life. The three spheres, given initial movements, went through complex, seemingly never-repeating movements. The descriptive equations rained down in a thunderstorm without end. Just like that, I fell asleep. The three spheres continued to dance in my dream, a patternless, never-repeating dance. Yet, in the depths of my mind, the dance did possess a rhythm. It was just that its period of repetition was infinitely long. This mesmerized me. I wanted to describe the whole period or at least a part of it. The next day I kept on thinking about the three spheres dancing in emptiness. My attention had never been so completely engaged. It got to the point where one of the monks asked the abbot whether I was having mental health issues. The abbot laughed and said, don't worry, he has found emptiness. Yes, I had found emptiness. Now I could be at peace in a bustling city. Even in the midst of a noisy crowd, my heart would be completely tranquil. For the first time, I enjoyed math. I felt like a libertine who's always fluttered carelessly from one woman to another, suddenly finding himself in love. The physics principles behind the three-body problem are very simple. It's mainly a math problem. Didn't you know about Henri Poincaré? Wang Yao interrupted way to ask. At the time, I didn't. 
Yes, I know that someone studying math should know about a master like Poincaré, but I didn't worship masters. I didn't want to become one, so I didn't know his work. But even if I had, I would have continued to pursue the three-body problem. Everyone seems to believe that Poincaré proved that the three-body problem couldn't be solved, but I think they're mistaken. He only proved sensitive dependence on initial conditions, and that the three-body system couldn't be solved by integrals. But sensitivity is not the same as being completely indeterminable. It's just that the solution contains a greater number of different forms. What's needed is a new algorithm. Back then, I, I thought of one thing. Have you heard of the Monte Carlo method? Uh, it's a computer algorithm often used for calculating the area of irregular shapes. Specifically, the software puts the figure of interest in a figure of known area, such as a circle, and randomly strikes it with many tiny balls, never targeting the same spot twice. After a large number of balls, the proportion of balls that fall within the irregular shape, compared to the total number of balls used to hit the circle, will yield the area of the shape. Of course, the smaller the balls used, the more accurate the result. Although the method is simple, it shows how mathematically random brute force can overcome precise logic. It has a numerical approach that uses quantity to derive quality. This is my strategy for solving the three-body problem. I study the system moment by moment. At each moment, the sphere's motion vectors can combine in infinite ways. I treat each combination like a light form. The key is to set up some rules, which combinations of motion vectors are healthy and beneficial, and which combinations are detrimental and harmful. The former receive a survival advantage while the latter are disfavored. The computation proceeds by eliminating the disadvantaged and preserving the advantaged. The final combination that survives is the correct prediction for the system's next configuration, the next moment in time. It's an evolutionary algorithm. Wong said. It's a good thing I invited you along. Shu Chiang nodded at Wong. Yes. Only much later did I learn that term. The distinguishing feature of this algorithm is that it requires ultra-large amounts of computing power. For the three-body problem, the computers we have now aren't enough. Back then, in the temple, I didn't even have a calculator. I had to go to the accounting office to get a blank ledger and a pencil. I began to build the math model on paper. This required a lot of work, and in no time at all I went through more than a dozen ledgers. The monks in charge of accounts were angry with me, but because the abbot wished it, they found me more paper and pen. I hid the completed calculations under my pillow and threw the scratch paper into the incense burner in the yard. One evening, a young woman suddenly dashed into my room. This was the first time a woman had shown up in my place. She clutched a few pieces of paper with burnt edges, the scratch paper I'd thrown out. And they tell me these are yours. Are you studying the three-body problem? Behind her wide glasses, her eyes seemed to be on fire. The woman surprised me. The math I used was unconventional, and my derivations took large leaps. But the fact that she could tell the subject of my study from a few pieces of scratch paper showed that she had unusual math talent, and that she, like me, was very devoted to the three-body problem. I didn't have a good impression of the tourists and pilgrims, the tourists had no idea what they were looking at, only running around to snap pictures. As for the pilgrims, they looked much poorer than the tourists, and all seemed to be in a state of numbness, their intellect inhibited. But this woman was different. She looked like an academic. Later I found out that she'd come with a group of Japanese tourists. Without waiting for my answer, she added, Your approach is brilliant. We've been searching for a method like this that could turn the difficulty of the three-body problem into a matter of massive computation. Of course, it would require a very powerful computer. I told her the truth. Even if we were to use all the computers in the world, it wouldn't be enough. But you must have an adequate research environment, and there's nothing like that here. I can give you the use of a supercomputer. I also give you a mini-computer. Let's leave together tomorrow morning. The woman, of course, was Shen Yifei. Like now, she was concise and authoritarian. But she was more attractive then. I'm naturally a cold person. I had less interest in women than the monks around me. This woman didn't adhere to conventional ideas about femininity. It was different, though. She attracted me. Since I had nothing to do anyway, I agree right away. That night, I couldn't sleep. 
I draped a shirt over my shoulders and walked out into the yard. In the distance, I saw Shen in the dim temple hall. She knelt before the Buddha with lit jaw sticks, and all her movements seemed full of piety. I approached noiselessly. As I came by the door to the temple hall, I heard her whisper a prayer. Buddha, please help my lord break away from the sea of misery. I thought I must have heard wrong, but she chanted the prayer again. Buddha, please help my lord break away from the sea of misery. I didn't understand religion and had no interest in any of them, but I really couldn't think of any prayer odder than this one. What do you say? I blurted. Shen ignored me, she kept her eyes barely closed, her hands clasped together in front of her, as though watching her prayer rise with the incense smoke toward the Buddha. After a long while, she finally opened her eyes and turned toward me. Go to sleep. We have to get up early. She didn't even look at me. This uh, Lord, you mentioned, is he part of Buddhism? I asked. No. Then... Shen said nothing, just hurried away. I didn't get a chance to ask anything else. I repeated the prayer to myself over and over, and it seemed to grow even stranger. Eventually, I became frightened. I rushed over to the abbot's room and knocked on his door. What, what does it mean if someone prays to the Buddha to help another lord? I, I then told him the details of what I saw. The abbot silently looked at the book in his hand, but he was thinking about what I said, not reading. And then he said, Please leave me for a bit. Let me think. I turned and left, knowing that it was unusual. The abbot was very learned. Usually he could answer any question about religion, history, and culture without having to think. I waited outside the door for about the time it took to smoke a cigarette, and the abbot called for me. I think there's only one possibility. His expression was grim. Well, what? What could it be? Could, could there be some religion whose god needs worshippers to pray to the gods of other religions to save it? Her lord really exists. This response confused me. Then the Buddha doesn't exist? As soon as I said it, I realized how rude it sounded. I apologized. The abbot slowly waved his hand at me. I told you, the two of us can't talk about Buddhism. The existence of the Buddha is a kind of existence that you cannot comprehend, but the, the Lord she's talking about exists in a way that you can understand. I can say no more concerning this matter. All I can do is counsel you against leaving with her. Why? It's just a feeling. I feel that behind her are things that you and I cannot imagine. I left the abbot's room and walked through the temple toward my room. The night had a full moon. I looked up at it and thought it a silvery, strange eye that gazed down at me. The light suffused with an eerie chill. The next day I did leave with Shen. I couldn't stay in the temple the rest of my life, after all. But I didn't think that over the next few years I would live the life of my dreams. Shen fulfilled her promise. I had a mini-computer and a comfortable environment. I even left the country several times to use supercomputers. Not time-sharing, but having the whole CPU to myself. She had a lot of money, though I didn't know where it came from. Later, we got married. There wasn't much love or passion, just mutual convenience. We both had things we wanted to get done. As for me, the few years after that could be described as a single day. My time passed peacefully. In her house I was taken care of and not... In her house I was taken care of and did not have to worry about food or clothing, so that I could devote myself to the study of the three-body problem. Chen never interfered with my life. The garage had a car that I could drive anywhere. I'm sure she wouldn't even have minded if I brought another woman home. She only paid attention to my research, and the only thing we talked about day to day was the three-body problem. Do you know what else Shan has been up to? Chi Chiang asked. Just the frontiers of science? She's busy with it all the time. Lots of people show up every day. She didn't ask you to join? Never. She never even talks to me about it. I don't care either. It's just the way I am. I don't want to care about anything. She knows it and says I'm an indolent man without any sense of purpose. 
The organization doesn't suit me and would interfere with my research. Have you made any progress with the three body problem? Wong asked. Well, compared with the general state of the field, my progress could be said to be a breakthrough. Some years ago, Richard Montgomery of UCSC and Alain Chancier of Université Paris Bido discovered another stable periodic solution to the three body problem. Under appropriate initial conditions, the three bodies will chase each other around a fixed figure eight curve. After that, everyone was keen to find such special stable configurations, and every discovery was greeted with joy. Only three or four such configurations have been found so far. But my evolutionary algorithm has already discovered more than a hundred stable configurations. Drawings of their orbits would fill a gallery with postmodern art. That's not my goal. A real solution to the three-body problem is to build a mathematical model so that given any initial configuration with known vectors, the model can predict all subsequent motion of the three-body system. This is also what Shen Yunfei craves. But my peaceful life ended yesterday. This is the crime you're reporting? Chu Chiang asked. Yes. A man called yesterday and told me that if I didn't cease my research, I would be killed. Who was he? I don't know. Phone number? Don't know. Caller ID showed nothing. Anything related to report? Don't know. Dasha laughed and tossed his cigarette butt into an ashtray. You went on and on forever. And in the end, all you have to report is one line and a few I don't knows. If I hadn't gone on like that, would you have understood the import of that call? Also, if that were all, I wouldn't have come here. I'm lazy, remember? But there was another thing. It was the middle of the night. I don't know if it was today or yesterday, and I was in bed. As I was drifting halfway between sleep and wakefulness, I felt something cold moving on my face. I opened my eyes and saw Shen Yufei, and I almost died of fright. What's so frightening about seeing your wife in the middle of the night? She stared at me in a way that I'd never seen. The light from outside fell on her face. She looked like a ghost. She held something in her hand. A gun. Moving the barrel over my face, she told me that I had to continue working on the three-body problem. Otherwise, she'd kill me. Ah. Uh... Now this is getting interesting. Dasha gave a satisfied nod. He lit another cigarette. Interesting? Look, I have nowhere to go. That's why I came to you. Tell us exactly what she said. She said, If you succeed in solving the three-body problem, you will be the savior of the world. If you stop now, you'll be a sinner. If someone were to save or destroy the human race, then your possible contribution or sin would be exactly twice as much as his. Yasha blew out a thick cloud of smoke and stared at Wei Cheng until he squirmed. He pulled a notepad out of the mess on his desk and picked up a pen. You wanted us to take notes, right? Repeat what you just said. Wei did. Wong said, What she said is indeed strange. What does she mean by exactly twice as much? Wei blinked. This seems pretty serious. When I came, the officer on duty immediately sent me to see you. I, it looks like you've already been paying attention to Shen and me. Dasha nodded. Let me ask you something else. Do you think the gun your wife held was real? You saw that Wei didn't know how to answer. Could you smell gun oil? Yes, there was definitely an oily smell. God. Dasha, who had been sitting on his desk, jumped off. Finally, we have an opening. Suspected illegal possession of firearms is enough to justify a search. I'll leave the paperwork until tomorrow because we have to move right away. He turned to Wong. Now, as for the weary, I have to ask you to come and advise me some more. Then he turned to Xu Bing Bing, who had been silent the whole time. Bang bang, right now I have only two men on duty, and that's not enough. I know the Information Security Division isn't used to field work, but I need you to come along. Shu nodded, glad to leave the smoke-filled office.
In addition to Da She and Xu, the team for conducting the search consisted of Wang Miao, Wei Chang, and two other officers from the criminal division. The six of them rode through the pre-dawn darkness in two police cars, heading toward Wei's neighborhood at the edge of the city. Xu and Wang were in the back seat. As soon as the car started, she whispered to Wang, Professor Wang, your reputation in Three Body is very high. Somebody mentioned Three Body in the real world. Wang was excited, right away feeling close to this young woman in a police uniform. Do you play? I'm responsible for monitoring and tracking it. An unpleasant task. Wong anxiously asked, Can you tell me its background? I really want to know. In the faint light coming through the car window, Wong saw Xu give a mysterious smile. We well, want to know as well, but all its servers are outside the country. The system and firewall are very secure and hard to penetrate. We don't know much, but we can be sure it's not operated for profit. The software quality is uncommonly high, and the amount of information contained in it even more unusual. It doesn't even seem like a game. Have there been any... Wong carefully picked the right words. Supernatural signs? Wong's night had been filled with coincidences. He had been called in to discuss the three-body problem with Wei Cheng immediately after he solved the three-body game. And now, Xu was telling him she was monitoring the game. Something didn't seem right. We don't think so. Many from all around the world participate in the game's development. Their collaboration methods seem similar to popular open source practices, like the kind used to make the Linux operating system. But they're definitely using some very advanced development tools. As for the content of the game, who knows where they're getting it. It does seem a bit supernatural, like you said. However, we still believe in Captain Show's famous rule, all this must be the work of people. Our tracking efforts are effective and we'll have results soon. The young woman was not experienced in lying, and her last remark made Wang realize that she was hiding much of the truth from him. His rule is famous now? Wang looked at Da Xu, who was in the driver's seat. When they reached the house, the sun had not yet risen. It was about the same time of night that Wang had seen Shen playing three-body. A second-story window was lit, but all the other windows were dark. As soon as Wang got out of the car, he heard noises coming from upstairs. It sounded like something was slapping against the wall. Dasha, who had just gotten out of the car himself, immediately became alert. He kicked open the yard gate and rushed into the house with an agility surprising for his burly frame, his three colleagues close behind. Wong and Wei followed them into the house. They went upstairs and entered the room with a lay on, their shoes splashing in a pool of blood. Chen lay in the middle of the room, blood still oozing from two bullet wounds in her chest. A third bullet had gone through her left brow, causing her whole face to be covered in red. Not far from her, a gun lay in a crimson pool. As Wong entered, Da Xia and one of the other officers rushed out and entered the dark room across the hall. The window there was open, and Wong heard the sound of a car starting outside. A male police officer began to make a phone call. Xu Bing Bing stood a little ways apart, watching anxiously. She, like Wong and the others, had probably never seen a scene like this. A moment later, Da Xia returned. He put his gun back in its holster and said to the officer holding the phone, A black Volkswagen Santana, with only one man. I couldn't get the license plate number. Tell him to block all entrances to the fifth ring road. Shit, he might actually get away. Dasha looked around and saw the bullet holes in the wall. He glanced at the shell casings scattered on the ground and added, The man got off five shots and three hit her. She shot twice, both misses. Then he crouched down to examine the body with the other officer. Xu stood farther away, stealing a glance at Wei Chang next to her. Dasha also looked up at him. On Wei's face was a trace of shock, and a trace of sorrow, but only a trace. His usual wooden expression didn't break. He was far calmer than Wong. You don't seem bothered by this, Dasha said to Wei. They probably came to kill you. Wei gave a ghastly grin. What can I do? Even now, I still don't know anything about her. I've told her many times to keep life simple. I I'm thinking of the abbot's counsel to me that night. But... Huh? Asha stood up and walked over to stand in front of Wei. He took out a cigarette and lit it. I think you still have some things you haven't told us. Some things I was 
too lazy to talk about. Then you'd better work harder now. Wei thought for a moment and said, Today, no, yesterday afternoon, she argued with a man in the living room. It's that Pan Han, the famous environmentalist. They had argued a few times before, in Japanese, as though afraid to have me listen in. But yesterday, they didn't care at all and argued in Chinese. I overheard a few snatches. Try to tell us exactly what you heard. Fine. Pan Han said, although we seem like fellow travelers on the surface, in reality, we are irreconcilable enemies. Chen said, yes, you're trying to use our Lord's power against the human race. Pan said, your understanding is not completely unreasonable. We want our Lord to come to this world to punish those who've long deserved it. However, you're working to prevent our Lord's coming, and that's why we can't tolerate you. If you don't stop, we'll make you stop. Chen said, the commander was blind to allow you to join the organization. Pan said, Speaking of, can you tell whether the commander sides with the Adventists or the Redemptionists? Does the commander want humanity eliminated or saved? Pan's words briefly silenced Chen, and the two didn't argue so loudly anymore. I couldn't hear anything else. What did the man who threatened you on the phone sound like? You're asking if he sounded like Pan Han? I don't know. He was speaking very softly and I couldn't tell. Several more police cars arrived, sirens blaring. A group of white-gloved policemen came upstairs with cameras, and the house hummed with activity. Dasha told Wong to go back and get some rest. Instead, Wong walked into the room with the mini-computer to find Wei. Can you give me an outline of your three-body evolutionary algorithm? I want to uh, introduce it to some people. I know my request is abrupt. If you can't, don't worry about it. Wei took out a CD and handed it to Wong. It's all on here. A whole model and additional documentation. Uh, do me a favor and publish it under your own name. That would be a big help. No, no, how could I do that? Wei pointed at the disc in Wong's hand and said, Professor Wong, I noticed you the first time you came here. You're a good man. A man with a sense of responsibility. That's why I'm counseling you to stay away from this. The world is about to change. Everyone should try to live out the rest of their lives in peace. That would be best. Don't worry too much about other matters. It's all useless anyway. You seem to know even more than you let on. I spent every day with her. It's impossible to have no inkling. Then why not tell the police? Wei smiled contemptuously. The police are worthless. Even if God were here wouldn't do any good. The entire human race has reached the point where no one is listening to their prayers. Wei was standing next to an east-facing window. Through the glass, beyond the distant cityscape, the sky was brightening with the first light of dawn. For some reason, the light reminded Wong of the strange dawn he saw each time he logged on to Three Body. In reality, I'm not so detached. I haven't been able to sleep the last few nights. Every morning when I see the sunrise, it feels like sunset. He turned to Wong, and after a long pause, added, And it's all because God, or the Lord she talked about, can't even protect himself anymore. 17. Three Body, Newton, von Neumann, the First Emperor, and Trisolar Syzygy. The start of the second level of three body wasn't too different than the first. Still the strange cold dawn, still that colossal pyramid. But this time, the pyramid was back in the Egyptian style. Wong heard the crisp sound of metal striking against metal. The clashing only highlighted the silence of the chilly dawn. Searching for the source, he saw two dark shadows flickering at the foot of the pyramid. In the dim light, metallic glints flashed between the shadows. A sword fight. Once his eyes had adjusted, Wong saw the figures more clearly. Based on the shape of the pyramid, this should be some place in Three Bodies version of the East, but the two fighters were Europeans, dressed in a 16th or 17th century style. The shorter one ducked below a swinging sword and his silvery wig fell to the ground. 
After a few more thrusts and parries, another man appeared around the corner of the pyramid and ran toward the fighters. He tried to get the two to stop, but the swinging blades whistling through the air prevented him from getting close. He shouted, Stop! Don't you two have anything better to do? Where's your sense of responsibility? Your civilization has no future. What good is this supposed bit of glory you're fighting over? Both sword fighters ignored him, concentrating on the duel. The taller one suddenly cried out in pain, and his sword fell to the ground with a clang. He turned and ran, holding his wounded arm. The other gave chase for a few steps, and spat in the direction of the loser. Shameless. <laughs> he bent down to pick up his wig. As he straightened up, he saw Wong. Pointing in the direction of the escapee, he said, He dared to claim that he invented calculus. He put on his wig, put a hand over his heart, and bowed courteously to Wong. Isaac Newton, at your service. Then the one who ran away must be Leibniz? Wong asked. Indeed, an unscrupulous man. I don't really care about this little claim to fame. Inventing the three laws of mechanics has already made me the greatest. Uh, God accept it. From planetary motion to cell division, everything follows the three great laws. Now, with a powerful mathematical tool that is calculus, it'll only be a matter of time before we master the pattern of the motion of the three suns. It's not that simple, said the man who had tried to stop the fight. If you considered the amount of calculation that's needed, I saw the differential equations you listed, and I don't think any analytical solution is possible, only a numerical one. However, the calculating capacity required is such that even if all of the world's mathematicians worked without pause, they'd still not be able to complete them by the time the world ended. Of course, if we can't figure out the pattern of the sun's movement soon, the end of the world will not be too far away. He bowed at Wong as well, a more modern bow. Von Neumann. Can you bring us thousands of miles to the east specifically to solve the problem of calculating these equations? Newton asked. Then he turned to Wong. Norbert Wainer, that degenerate who just ran away, also came with us. We encountered some pirates near Madagascar. Wainer fought the pirates by himself so that the rest of us could escape, and he died, valiantly. Why did you have to come to the East to build a computer? Wong asked von Neumann. Von Neumann and Newton looked at each other, puzzled. A computer? A computing machine? Such a thing exists? You don't know about computers? Then what did you have in mind for completing the vast amount of calculations? Von Neumann stared at Wong with wide open eyes, as though his question made no sense. Using people, of course. Other than people, what else in the world is capable of performing calculations? But you just said that all the mathematicians in the world wouldn't be enough. Instead of mathematicians, we'll use common laborers. But we need many of them, at least 30 million. We'll do mathematics using human wave tactics. <laughs> common laborers. 30 million? Wong was amazed. But if I recall correctly, this is an age when 90% of the population are illiterate. Yet, you want to find 30 million people who understand calculus? Have you heard the joke about the army of Sichuan? Von Neumann took out a thick cigar, bit off the end, and lit it. Sob soldiers were being drilled. Uh, because they had no education, they couldn't even follow the drill instructor's simple orders to march left, right, left. So the instructor came up with a solution. He had every soldier wear a straw shoe on the left foot and a cloth shoe on the right. When they marched, he shouted, here he switched to a Sichuan accent. Straw cloth, straw cloth. That's the kind of soldier we need. Except we need 30 million of them. Hearing this modern joke, Wong knew that the man before him wasn't a program, but a real person, and almost certainly Chinese. It's hard to imagine such a large army, Wong said, shaking his head. That's why we've come to see Qin Shi Huang, the first emperor. Newton pointed at the pyramid. He's still in charge? Wong looked around. He saw that the soldiers guarding the entrance to the pyramid really were equipped with the simple leather armor and Xi-style halberds of the Qin dynasty. The anachronistic mix of historical elements in three-body no longer surprised him. 
The whole world is going to be under his rule because he has an army of more than 30 million preparing to conquer Europe. All right, mm, let's go see him. Von Neumann turned to Newton. Drop the sword. Newton obeyed. The three of them entered the pyramid, and just as they were about to emerge from the tunnel into the Great Hall, a guard insisted that they strip off all their clothes. Newton objected. We're famous scholars. No one of our stature would carry hidden weapons. As the two sides explored this stalemate, a deep male voice came from the Great Hall. Is it the foreigner who discovered the three laws of motion? Let him and his companions in. They entered the Great Hall. The first emperor was pacing back and forth, his robe and his famous longsword both dragging along the ground. As he turned to gaze at the three scholars, Wong realized that his eyes were the same as the eyes of King Zhou of Shang and Pope Gregory. I already know the purpose of your visit. You're Europeans. When I go find Caesar, his empire is vast. Surely he can find you 30 million men. But my most honored emperor, do you know what kind of army he has? Do you know what shape his empire is in? In the magnificent eternal city of Rome, even the river that flows through the city has been heavily polluted. Do you know the cause? Military industrial production? No, great emperor. It's the vomit from Romans after their binge and purge feasts. When the nobles attend the feasts, stretchers have already been prepared for them under the tables. When they've eaten so much that they can no longer move, the servants carry them home. The entire empire is sunk into a quagmire of extravagance from which they cannot extricate themselves. Even if Caesar could organize an army of 30 million, it would not have the quality and strength necessary to perform this great calculation. I am aware of that, Qin Shi Huang said. But Caesar is waking up and reinvigorating his army. The wisdom of Westerners is terrifying. You are not more intelligent than the men of the East, but you can see the right path. For example, Copernicus could figure out that there are three suns, and you could come up with your three laws. These are very impressive accomplishments. We here in the East cannot for now match them. I don't possess the ability to conquer Europe. My ships are not good enough, and the supply lines cannot be maintained for long enough to go over land. That's why your empire must continue to develop, great emperor. Von Neumann seized the opportunity. If you can master the pattern of the sun's movements, you will be able to make the most of each stable era, and also avoid the damage brought by each chaotic era. This way, your progress will be much faster than Europe's. Believe us, we are scholars. As long as we can use the three laws of motion and calculus to accurately forecast the movements of the suns, we do not care who conquers the world. Of course, I need to predict the sun's movements. But if you want me to gather 30 million men, you must at least demonstrate for me how such calculations would be conducted. Your Imperial Majesty, please give me three soldiers. I will demonstrate. Von Neumann grew excited. Three? Only three. I can easily give you 3,000. Qin Zhe Huang glanced at Von Neumann, distrustful. Your Imperial Majesty. You mentioned just now the defect in the Eastern mind when it comes to scientific thinking. This is because you have not realized that even the complicated objects of the universe are made from the simplest elements. They only need three. Qin Shi Huang waved his hand and three soldiers came forward. They were all very young. Like other Qin soldiers, they moved like order-obeying machines. I do not know your names, von Neumann said, tapping the shoulders of two of the soldiers. <laughs> The two of you will be responsible for signal input, so I'll call you input one and input two. He pointed to the last soldier. You will be responsible for signal output, so I'll call you output. He shoved the soldiers to where he wanted them to stand. Form a triangle. I like this. Output is the apex, input one and input two form the base. You could have just told him to stand in the wedge attack formation. Ching Shi Huang said, glancing at von Neumann contemptuously. Newton took out six small flags, three white, three black. Von Neumann handed them out to the three soldiers so that each held a black flag and a white flag. White represents zero, black represents one. Good. Now, listen to me, output. You turn around and look at input one and input two. If they both raise black flags, you raise a black flag as well. Under all other circumstances, you raise the white flag. I think you should use some other color, Qin Shi Huang said. White means surrender. Mm -hmm. The excited von Neumann ignored him. 
He shouted orders at the three soldiers. Begin operation. Input one and input two. You can raise whichever flag you want. Good. Raise. Good. Raise again. Raise. Input one and input two raised their flags three times. The first time they were black black. The second time white black. And the third time black white. Output reacted correctly each time. Raising the black flag once and the white one twice. Very good. Your Imperial Majesty, your soldiers are very smart. Even an idiot would be capable of that. Tell me, what are they really doing? Ching Shev Wang looked baffled. The three soldiers form a computing component. It's a type of gate. An AND gate. Von Neumann paused to let the Emperor digest this information. Ching Shev Wang said impassively, I'm not impressed. Continue. Von Neumann turned to the three soldiers again. Let's form another component. You, output. If you see either input 1 or input 2 raise a black flag, you raise the black flag. There are three situations where that will be true. Black black, white black, black white. When it's white white, you raise the white flag. Understand? Good lad. You're really clever. You're the key to the correct functioning of the gate. Work hard and the Emperor will reward you. Let's begin operation. Raise. Good. Raise again. Raise again. Perfect. Your Imperial Majesty, this component is called an OR gate. Then, Von Neumann used the three soldiers to form a NAND gate, a NOR gate, an XOR gate, an XNOR gate, and a TRI-STATE gate. Finally, using only two soldiers, he made the simplest gate, a NOT gate, or an inverter. Output always raised the flag that was opposite in color from the one raised by input. Von Neumann bowed to the Emperor. Now, your Imperial Majesty, all the gate components have been demonstrated. Aren't they simple? Yeah. Any three soldiers can master the skills after one hour of training. Don't they need to learn more? Chin Shi Wong asked. No. We inform 10 million of these gates, and then put the components together into a system. This system will then be able to carry out the calculations we need and work out those differential equations for predicting the sun's movements. We could call the system... Um... A computer. Wong said. Ah, good. Von Neumann gave Wong a thumbs up. Computer. That's a great name. The entire system is a large machine, the most complex machine in the history of the world. The passage of in-game time sped up. Three months went by. Chen Chou Wong, Newton, Von Neumann and Wong all stood on the platform at the apex of the pyramid. This platform was similar to the one where Wong had met Mozart. It was filled with astronomical instruments, some of which were of recent European design. Below them, a magnificent phalanx of 30 million Qin soldiers was arrayed on the ground. The entire formation fit inside a square six kilometers on each side. As the sun rose, the phalanx remained still, like a giant carpet made of 30 million terracotta warriors. But when a flock of birds wandered above the phalanx, the birds immediately felt the potential for death from below, and scattered anxiously in chaos. Wong performed some computations in his head, and realized that even if the entire population of birth were arranged into such a phalanx, the whole formation would fit inside the Wangpu district of Shanghai. Though it was powerful, the phalanx also revealed the fragility of civilization. Guan Neumann said, Your Imperial Majesty, your army is truly matchless. In an extremely short time, we have completed such complex training. Ching Shi Huang held on to the hilt of his longsword. Even though the whole is complex, what each soldier must do is very simple. Compared to the training they went through to learn how to break the Macedonian phalanx, this is nothing. Newton added, And God bless us with two consecutive stable errors to get them trained and ready. Even in a chaotic era, my army continues to train. They will finish your calculations even if it's a chaotic era. Qin Shi Huang glanced over the phalanx with pride in his eyes. Then, your Imperial Majesty, please give the great order. Von Neumann's voice trembled with excitement. Qin Shi Huang nodded. A guard ran over, grabbed the hilt of the Emperor's sword and stepped backwards. The bronze sword was so long that it was impossible for the Emperor himself to pull it out of the scabbard. The guard knelt and handed the sword to the Emperor. Qin Shi Huang lifted the sword to the sky and shouted, Computer Formation! Four giant bronze cauldrons at the corners of the platform came to life simultaneously with roaring flames. 
A group of soldiers standing on the sloping side of the pyramid, facing the phalanx, chanted in unison, Computer Formation. On the ground below, colors in the phalanx began to shift and move. Complicated and detailed circuit patterns appeared and gradually filled the entire formation. Ten minutes later, the army had made a 36-kilometer square computer motherboard. Von Neumann pointed to the gigantic human circuit below the pyramid and began to explain. Your Imperial Majesty, we have named this computer Qin Wan. Look, there in the center is the CPU, the core computing component, formed from your five best divisions. By referencing this diagram, you can locate the adders, registers, and stack memory. The part around it that looks highly regular is the memory. When we built that part, we found that we didn't have enough soldiers. But, luckily, the work done by the elements in this component is the simplest, so we trained each soldier to hold more colored flags. Each man can now complete the work that initially required 20 men. This allowed us to increase the memory capacity to meet the minimum requirements for running the Qin 1.0 operating system. Observe also the open passage that runs through the entire formation, and the light cavalry waiting for orders in that passage. Hmm? That's the system bus, responsible for transmitting information between the components of the whole system. Uh, the bus architecture is a great invention. New plug-in components, which can be made from up to 10 divisions, can quickly be added to the main operation bus. This allows Qin One's hardware to be easily expanded and upgraded. Look further still. You might have to use the telescope for this. And there's the external storage, which we call the hard drive, at Copernicus's suggestion. It's formed by three million soldiers with more education than most. When you buried all those scholars alive after you unified China, it's a good thing you saved these ones. Each of them holds a pen and a notepad, and they're responsible for recording the results of the calculations. Uh, of course, the bulk of their work is to act as virtual memory and store intermediate calculation results. They're the bottleneck for the speed of computation. Computation. And, finally, the part that's closest to us is the display. It's capable of showing us, in real time, the most important parameters of the computation. Von Neumann and Newton carried over a large scroll, tall as a man, and spread it open before Qin Shi Huang. When they reached the scroll's end, Huang's chest tightened, remembering the legend of the assassin who hid a dagger in a map scroll that he then displayed to the Emperor. But, the imaginary dagger did not appear. Before them was only a large sheet of paper filled with symbols, each the size of a fly's head. Packed so densely, the symbols were as dazzling to behold as the computer formation on the ground below. Your Imperial Majesty, this is the Qin 1.0 operating system we developed. The software for doing the calculations will run on top of it. That, below, Von Neumann pointed to the human formation computer, is the hardware. What's on this paper is the software. The relationship between hardware and software is like that between the Guccin zither and sheet music. Ian Newton then spread open another scroll, just as large. Your Imperial Majesty, this is the software for using numerical methods to solve those differential equations. After entering the motion vectors of the three suns at a particular moment obtained by astronomical observation, the software's operation will give us a prediction for the sun's subsequent motion at any moment in the future. Our first computation will calculate all the sun's positions for the next two years. Each set of output values will be 120 hours apart. Ching Shi Huang nodded. Good. Begin. Mm -hmm. Von Neumann lifted both hands above his head and solemnly chanted, As ordered by the Great Emperor, turn on the computer. System South Test. A row of soldiers standing halfway down the face of the pyramid repeated the order using flag signals. In a moment, the motherboard made of 30 million men seemed to turn into a lake filled with sparkling lights. Tens of millions of tiny flags waved. In the display formation closest to the base of the pyramid, a progress bar made of numerous green flags slowly advanced, indicating the percentage of the self-test that had been completed. Ten minutes later, the progress bar reached its end. Subtest complete. Begin boot sequence. Load operating system. Below, the light cavalry on the main bus that passed through the entire human formation computer began to move swiftly. The main bus soon turned into a turbulent river. Along the way, the river fed into numerous thin tributaries, infiltrating all the modular subformations. Soon, the ripple of black and white flags coalesced into surging waves that filled the entire motherboard. The central CPU area was the most tumultuous, like gunpowder on fire. 
But suddenly, as though the powder had been exhausted, the movements in the CPU slackened and eventually stopped. Starting with the CPU in the center, the stillness spread in every direction, like a sea being frozen over. Finally, the entire motherboard came to a stop, with only a few scattered components flashing lifelessly in infinite loops. The center of the display formation blinked red. System lock up! A signal officer called out. Shortly after, the reason for the malfunction was determined. There was an error with the operation of one of the gates in the CPU status register. Restart system, von Neumann ordered confidently. Wait! Newton stopped the signal officer. He turned with an insidious expression and said to Qin Shi Huang, Your Imperial Majesty, in order to improve system stability, you should take certain maintenance measures with respect to faulty components. Qin Shi Huang grasped his sword and said, Replace the malfunctioning component and behead all the soldiers who made up that gate. In the future, any malfunction will be dealt with the same way. Von Neumann glanced at Newton, disgusted. They watched as a few riders dashed into the motherboard with their swords unsheathed. After they repaired the faulty component, the order to restart was given. This time, the operation went very smoothly. Twenty minutes later, Three Bodies von Neumann Architecture Human Formation Computer had begun full operations under the Qin 1.0 operating system. Run Solar Orbit Computation Software Three Body 1.0! Newton screamed at the top of his lungs. Start the Master Computing Module! Load the Differential Calculus Module! Load the Finite Element Analysis Module! Load the Spectral Method Module! Enter Initial Condition Parameters and begin calculation! The motherboard sparkled as the display formation flashed with indicators in every color. The human formation computer began the long computation. This is really interesting. Jing Shi Huang said, pointing to the spectacular sight. Each individual's behavior is so simple, yet together they can produce such a complex great whole. Europeans criticize me for my tyrannical rule, claiming that I suppress creativity. But in reality, a large number of men yoked by severe discipline can also produce great wisdom when bound together as one. Ray First Emperor, this is just the mechanical operation of a machine, not wisdom. Each of these lowly individuals is just a zero. Only when someone like you is added to the front as a one can the whole have any meaning. Newton's smile was ingratiating. Disgusting philosophy! Von Neumann said as he glanced at Newton. If, in the end, the results computed in accordance with your theory and mathematical model don't match reality, then you and I aren't even zeros. Indeed. If that turns out to be the case, you will be nothing. Qin Shi Huang turned and left the scene. Mm -hmm. Time passed quickly. The human formation computer operated for a year and four months. Subtracting out the time spent to adjust the programming, the actual processing time was approximately a year and two months. During this time, processing had to be stopped twice due to extremely bad weather in chaotic eras. But the computer stored the data at the time of each shutdown, and was able to resume calculations successfully after the pauses. By the time Qin Shi Huang and the European scholars ascended the pyramid again, the first phase of the computation was complete. The results precisely described the orbits of the three suns for the next two years. It was a chilly dawn. The torches that had kept the motherboard lit through the night were extinguished. After the final calculation, Qin Wan entered standby mode. The turbulent waves over the motherboard settled into light ripples. Von Neumann and Newton presented the scroll with the results of the computation to Qin Shi Huang. Newton said, Gray First Emperor, the calculations were completed three days ago. We waited until now to present the results to you because they show that the long night is about to be over. We'll soon welcome the first sunrise of a long, stable era, which will last more than a year. Judging by the orbital parameters, the climate will be extremely mild and comfortable. Please revive your empire and order everyone to be rehydrated. Ever since the start of this computation, my empire has never been dehydrated. Qin Shi Huang said in a huff, grabbing the scroll. I devoted all the resources of the Qin Empire to maintain the operation of the computer, and we've run out of stored supplies. For this computer, countless people have died of hunger, cold, and heat. 
Ching pointed into the distance with the scroll. By the dim dawn light, they could see tens of white lines radiating from the edges of the motherboard in every direction. Disappearing over the horizon. These were the supply routes from every corner of the Empire. Your Imperial Majesty. You will find that the sacrifices are worth it, von Neumann said. After mastering the orbits of the suns, Sheen will develop by leaps and bounds and will grow many times more powerful than before. According to the calculations, the sun is about to rise. Great First Emperor, prepare to receive your glory. As if in response to Newton's words, a sliver of red sun peeked over the horizon bathing the pyramid and the human formation computer in a golden light. A wave of joyous cries rose from the motherboard. A man hurried toward them. He was running so fast that as he knelt down he couldn't catch his breath. He was the Emperor's astronomy minister. I... the calculations were an error. Disaster is not only to befall us. What are you babbling about? Without even waiting for the Emperor to speak, Newton kicked the man. Don't you see that the sun is rising at the exact moment predicted by our precise calculations? The minister half straightened, one hand pointing at the sun. How many suns do you see? Everyone gazed at the rising sun, confused. Minister, you received a proper Western education and obtained a doctorate from the University of Cambridge, von Neumann said. You must at least know how to count. Of course, there's only one sun in the sky, and the temperature is very comfortable. No, there are three, the minister cried, tears flowing from his face. The other two are behind that one. Everyone stared at the sun again, still confused. The Imperial Observatory has confirmed that right now we are experiencing the extremely rare phenomenon of a tri-solar syzygy. The three suns are in a straight line moving around our planet at the same angular speed. Thus our planet and the three suns are in a straight line with our world at the end. You're certain that the observation is not an error? Newton grabbed the collar of the astronomy minister. Absolutely certain. The observation was conducted by the Western astronomers of the Imperial Observatory, including Kepler and Herschel. They're using the largest telescope in the world, imported from Europe. Newton let go of the minister and stood up. Wong saw that his face was pale, but his expression was one of pure joy. He clasped his two hands in front of his chest and said to Qin Shi Huang, Oh, greatest, most honorable emperor, this is the most propitious sign of them all. Now that the three suns are orbiting around our planet, your empire is the center of the universe. This is God's reward for our efforts. Let me check the calculations one more time. I will prove this. While the rest remained stunned, Newton slipped away. Later, Others would report that Sir Isaac had stolen a horse and left for parts unknown. An anxiety-filled moment of silence later, Wong suddenly said, Your Imperial Majesty, please unsheath your sword. What do you want? Chen Shi Huang asked, baffled. But he gestured at the soldier by his side, and the soldier pulled the sword out of its scabbard. Wong said, Please try to swing it. Chen Shi Huang held the sword and waved it around. His expression turned to one of surprise. Oh, why is it so light? The Dane's Visu cannot simulate the feeling of diminished gravity. Otherwise, we'd feel that we're much lighter as well. Look, down there, look at the horses and the men. Someone cried out. Everyone looked down and saw a column of cavalry moving at the foot of the pyramid. All the horses seemed to be floating. Each horse drifted over a long distance before the four hoods struck ground again. They also saw several running men. With each step, the men leapt a dozen meters, falling slowly back to the ground. On top of the pyramid, a soldier tried to jump up and easily reached the height of three meters. What is going on? Ching Shi Huang looked at the soldier slowly falling back down. Fire? The three suns are over our planet in a straight line, so their gravitational forces are added together. The astronomy minister tried to explain, but discovered that his two feet had already left the ground, and he was now horizontal. The others were also floating in the air, leaning at different angles. Like a bunch of men who had fallen into water without knowing how to swim, they clumsily waved their limbs, trying to stabilize themselves, but colliding into each other instead. The ground they had just left now cracked open like a spiderweb. 
The cracks grew fast and accompanied by thunderous crashes and sky-obscuring dust, the pyramid below them broke into its constituent blocks. Through the slowly drifting gigantic blocks, Wong saw the great hall below come apart. The large cauldron that had once cooked Fu Si and the iron stake to which he had once been bound were both adrift. The sun rose to the middle of the sky. Everything that floated, men, colossal blocks of stone, astronomical instruments, bronze cauldrons, began to rise slowly, then accelerated. Wong glanced at the human formation computer and saw a nightmarish sight. The 30 million men who had formed the motherboard were floating away from the earth and rising like a swarm of ants sucked up by a vacuum cleaner. The ground they left behind clearly displayed the marks of the motherboard circuits. The set of intricate, complex markings that could only be taken in from a great height would become an archaeological site that would confuse the next three-body civilization in the distant future. Wong looked up. The sky was obscured by a strangely mottled layer of clouds. The clouds were made of dust, stones, humans, and other odds and ends. The sun sparkled behind them. In a far distance, Wong saw a long range of transparent mountains also rising up. The mountains were crystal clear, and changed shapes as they sparkled. They were formed from the ocean, which was also being attracted into space. Everything on the surface of the three-body world rose toward the sun. Wong looked around and saw von Neumann and Qin Shi Huang. As he drifted, von Neumann shouted at Qin Shi Huang, but there was no sound. A small set of subtitles appeared. I figured it out! Electronic elements. We can use electronic elements to make gate circuits and combine them into computers. Such computers will be many times faster and take up much less space. I estimate that a small building will be sufficient. Your Imperial Majesty, are you listening? Qin Zhe Huang swung his long sword at von Neumann. The latter kicked at a giant block of stone drifting nearby and dodged out of the way. The long sword struck the stone, causing sparks to fly, and broke itself into two pieces. Right after, the giant block of stone collided with another, with Jin Shi Huang in the middle. Stone chips and flesh and blood scattered everywhere. An appalling sight. But Wong did not hear the noise made by colliding stones. Around him, it was completely silent. Because the atmosphere was gone, there was no more sound. As the bodies drifted, their blood boiled in the vacuum, and their inner organs were vomited out, until they turned into strange blobs surrounded by crystalline clouds, made from the liquid they exuded. Also, due to the lack of an atmosphere, the sky turned pitch black. Everything that had floated into space from the three-body world reflected the sunlight and formed a brilliant, starry cloud in space. The cloud then turned into a giant vortex, spiraling toward its final resting place, the sun. Wong now saw the sun changing shape. He understood that he was actually seeing the other two suns, both peeking out from behind the first sun. From this perspective, the three stacked suns formed a bright eye in the universe. Against the background of the three suns in Syzygy, text appeared. Civilization number 184 was destroyed by the stacked gravitational attractions of a tri-solar syzygy. This civilization had advanced to the scientific revolution and the industrial revolution. In this civilization, Newton established non-relativistic classical mechanics. At the same time, due to the invention of calculus and the von Neumann architecture computer, the foundation was set for the quantitative mathematical analysis of the motion of three bodies. After a long time, Life and civilization will begin once more, and progress through the unpredictable world of three body. We invite you to log on again. Just as Wong logged out of the game, a stranger called. The voice on the phone was that of a very charismatic man. Hello! First, we thank you for giving us your real number. I'm a system administrator for the three body game. Wong was both excited and anxious. Please, tell us your age, education, employer, and position. You didn't fill those out when you registered. What do they have to do with the game? When you've reached this level, you must provide these pieces of information. If you refuse, Three Body will be permanently closed to you. Wong answered the administrator's questions truthfully. 
Very good, Professor Wong. You satisfy the conditions for continuing in three body. Thank you. Can I ask you a few questions? You may not, but tomorrow night there will be a meetup for three body players. We welcome you to attend. The administrator gave Wong an address. 18. Meetup. The location for the three body players meetup was a small out of the way coffee shop. Wong had always imagined game meetups would be lively events full of people. But this meetup consisted of only seven players, including himself. Well, like Wong, the other six did not look like gaming enthusiasts. Only two were relatively young. Another three, including a woman, were middle-aged. There was also an old man who appeared to be in his 60s or 70s. Wong had originally thought that as soon as they met they'd begin a lively discussion of Three Body. But he was wrong. The profound but strange content of Three Body had had a psychological impact on the participants. All the players, including Wong himself, couldn't bring it up easily. They only made simple self-introductions. The old man took out a refined pipe, filled it with tobacco, and smoked as he strolled around, admiring the paintings on the walls. The others sat silently, waiting for the meetup organizer to show up. They had all come early. Actually, of the six, Wong already knew, too. The old man was a famous scholar who had made his name by imbuing Eastern philosophy with the content of modern science. The strangely dressed woman was a famous writer, one of those rare novelists who wrote in an avant-garde style but still had many readers. You could start one of her books on any page. Of the two middle-aged men, one was a vice president at China's largest software company, plainly and casually dressed so that his status wasn't obvious at all and the other was a high-level executive at the State Power Corporation. Of the two young men, one was a reporter with a major media outlet, and the other was a doctoral student in the sciences. Wong now realized that a considerable number of three-body players were probably social elites like them. The meetup organizer showed up not long after. Wong's heart began to beat faster as soon as he saw the man. It was Pan Han, prime suspect for the murder of Shen Yufei. He took out his phone when no one was looking, and texted Shu Chiang. Ha <laughs> ha Everyone got here early. Pan greeted them in a relaxed manner, as though nothing was wrong. Appearing in the media, he usually looked disheveled, like a vagrant. But today, he was dressed sharply in a suit and dress shoes. Yeah, just like I imagined. Three bodies intended for people in your class, because the common crowd cannot appreciate its meaning and mood. To play it well requires knowledge and understanding that ordinary people do not possess. Wong sent out his text. Spotted Pan Han at Yunhee Coffee Shop in Sichang District. Pan continued. Everyone here is an excellent three-body player. You have the best scores and are devoted to it. I believe that three-body is already an important part of your lives. It's part of what keeps me alive the young doctoral student said. I saw it by accident on my grandson's computer, the old philosopher said, lifting his pipe stem. The young man abandoned it after a few tries, saying it was too abstruse. But I was attracted to it. I find it strange, terrible, but also beautiful. So much information is hidden beneath a simple representation. A few players nodded at this description, including Wong himself. Wong received Da Xu's reply text. We also see him. No worries, carry on. Play the fanatic in front of them, but not so much that you can't pull it off. Yes, the author agreed and nodded. I like the literary elements of Three Body. The rises and falls of 203 civilizations evoke the qualities of epics in a new form. She mentioned 203 civilizations, but Wong had only experienced 184. This told Wong that three body progressed independently for each player, possibly with different worlds. I'm a bit sick of the real world, the young reporter said. Three bodies already my second reality. Really? Pond asked, interested. Me too, the software company vice president said. Compared to three body, Reality is so vulgar and unexciting. It's too bad that it's only a game, said the power company executive. Very good, Pond said. 
Wong noticed his eyes sparkling with excitement. I have a question that uh, I think everyone wants to know the answer to. Wong said. I know what it is, but you might as well ask. Is three body only a game? The other players nodded. Clearly the question was also on their minds. Pan stood up and said solemnly, the world of three body, or Trisolaris, really does exist. Where is it? Several players asked in unison. After looking at each of them in turn, Pan sat down and spoke. Some questions I can answer, others I cannot. But if you are meant to be with Trisolaris, all your questions will be answered someday. Then, does the game really portray Trisolaris accurately? The reporter asked. First, the ability of Trisolaris to dehydrate through its many cycles of civilization is real. In order to adapt to the unpredictable natural environment and avoid extreme environmental conditions unsuitable for life, they can completely expel the water in their bodies and turn into dry, fibrous objects. What do Trisolarans look like? Pawn shook his head. I don't know. I really don't. In every cycle of civilization, the appearance of Trisolarans is different. However, the game does portray something else that really existed on Trisolaris. The Trisolaran Formation Computer. Ha! <laughs> I thought that was the most unrealistic aspect, the software company vice president said. I conducted a test with more than a hundred employees at my company. Even if the idea worked, a computer made of people would probably operate at a speed slower than manual computation. Khan gave a mysterious smile. You're right. But suppose that of the 30 million soldiers forming the computer, each one is capable of raising and lowering the black and white flags a hundred thousand times per second. And suppose also that the light cavalry soldiers on the main bus can run at several times the speed of sound, or even faster. Then the result would be very different. You asked about the appearance of the Trisolarans just now. According to some signs, the bodies of the Trisolarans who formed the computer were covered by a purely reflective surface, which probably evolved as a response to survival under extreme conditions of sunlight. The mirror-like surface could be deformed into any shape, and they communicated with each other by focusing light with their bodies. This kind of light speech could transmit information extremely rapidly was the foundation of the Trisolaran formation computer. Of course, this was still a very inefficient machine, but it was capable of completing calculations that were too difficult to be performed manually. The computer did in fact make its first appearance in Trisolaris as formations of people, before becoming mechanical, and then electronic. Pawn stood up and paced behind the players. As a game, Free Body only borrows the background of human society to simulate the development of Trisolaris. This is done to give players a familiar environment. The real Trisolaris is very different from the world of the game, but the existence of the Three Sons is real. They are the foundation of the Trisolaran environment. Developing this game must have cost an enormous amount of effort, the Vice President said. But the goal is clearly not profit. The goal of three body is very simple and pure. To gather those of us who have common ideals, Pond said. What ideals do we have in common exactly? Wong immediately regretted the question. He wondered whether asking it sounded hostile. Pond studied everyone meaningfully, and then added in a soft voice, How would you feel? If Trisolaran civilization were to enter our world, I would be happy. The young reporter was the first to break the silence. I've lost hope in the human race after what I've seen in recent years. Human society is incapable of self-improvement, and we need the intervention of an outside force. I agree, the author shouted. She was very excited, as though finally finding an outlet for pent-up feelings. The human race is hideous. I spent the first half of my life unveiling this ugliness with the scalpel of literature, but now I'm even sick of the work of dissection. I yearn for Trisolaran civilization to bring real beauty to this world. Tom said nothing. That glint of excitement appeared in his eyes again. The old philosopher waved his pipe, which had gone out, 
He spoke with a serious mien. Let's discuss this question with a bit more depth. What is your impression of the Aztecs? Dark and bloody, the author said. Blood-drenched pyramids lit by insidious fires seen through dark forests. Those are my impressions. The philosopher nodded. Very good. Then try to imagine, if the Spanish conquistadors did not intervene, what would have been the influence of that civilization on human history? You're calling black white and white black, the software company vice president said. The conquistadors who invaded the Americas were nothing more than murderers and robbers. Even so, at least they prevented the Aztecs from developing without bound, turning the Americas into a bloody, dark, great empire. Then civilization as we know it wouldn't have appeared in the Americas, and democracy wouldn't have thrived until much later. Indeed, maybe they wouldn't have appeared at all. This is the key to the question. No matter what the Trisolarans are like, their arrival will be good news for the terminally ill human race. But have you thought through the fact that the Aztecs were completely destroyed by the Western invaders? The power company executive asked. He looked around as though seeing these people for the first time. Your thoughts are very dangerous. You mean profound, the doctoral student said, raising a finger. He nodded vigorously at the philosopher. I have the same thought, but I didn't know how to express it. You said it so well. After a moment of silence, Pawn turned to Wong. The other six have all given their views. What about you? I stand with them, Wong said, pointing to the reporter and the philosopher. He kept his answer simple. The less said, the better. Very good, Pawn said. He turned to the software company vice president and the power company executive. The two of you are no longer welcome at this meetup, and you are no longer appropriate players for Three Body. Your IDs will be deleted. Please, leave now. Thank you. The two stood up and looked at each other, then glanced around, confused, and left. Han held out his hand to the remaining five, shaking each person's hand in turn. Then, he said solemnly, We are comrades now. 19. Three Body Einstein, the Pendulum Monument, and the Great Rip. The fifth time Wong Miao logged on to Three Body, it was dawn, as usual, but the world was unrecognizable. The Great Pyramid that had appeared the first four times had been destroyed by the Trisolar Syzygy. In its place was a tall modern building, whose dark grey shape was familiar to Wong, at the United Nations headquarters. In the distance were many more tall buildings, apparently dehydratories. All had completely reflective mirror surfaces. In the dawn light they appeared as giant crystal plants growing out of the ground. Wong heard a violin playing something by Mozart. The playing wasn't very practiced, but there was a special charm to it, as though saying, I play for myself. The violinist was a homeless old man, sitting on the steps in front of the UN headquarters, his fluffy silver hair fluttering in the wind. Next to his feet was an old top hat containing some scattered change. Wong suddenly noticed the sun, but it rose in the opposite direction from the dawn light, and the patch of the sky around it was still completely dark. The sun was very large, its half-risen disk taking up a third of the horizon. Wong's heart beat faster. Such a large sun could only mean another great catastrophe. But when Wong turned around, the old man continued to play as though nothing odd was happening. His silver hair shone brilliantly in the sun, as though it was on fire. The sun was silvery, just like the old man's hair. It cast a pale white light over the ground, but Wong couldn't feel any warmth from the light. He gazed at the sun, which had now completely risen. On the giant silver disc, he could pick out lines like wood grains, mountain ranges. Wong realized that the disc did not emit light, it only reflected the light from the real sun, which was on the other side of the sky, below the horizon. What had risen wasn't a sun at all, but a giant moon. The giant moon moved briskly up the sky at a pace that could be detected by the naked eye. 
In the process it gradually waned from a full to a half moon, and then a crescent. The old man's soothing violin strains drifted on the cold morning breeze. The majestic sight of the universe was like the music made material. Wong was intoxicated. The giant crescent now fell into the dawn light and grew much brighter. When only two glowing tips remained above the horizon, Wong imagined them as the tips of the horns of a titanic bull rushing toward the sun. Honored Copernicus, rest your busy feet here a while. The old man said after the giant moon had set. Then, after you've appreciated some Mozart, perhaps I can have some lunch. If I'm not mistaken, Ron looked at the face full of wrinkles. The wrinkles were long and their curves gentle, as though they were trying to create a kind of harmony. Well, you're not. I'm Einstein, a pitiful man full of faith in God, though abandoned by him. What is that giant moon? I've never seen it the previous times I was here. It's already cooled off. But it's a big moon. When I was little, it was still hot. When it rose to the middle of the sky, I could see the red glow from the central plains. But now, it's cold. Mm. Haven't you heard about the Great Rip? No, what's that? Einstein sighed and shook his head. Let's not speak of it. Forget the past. My past, civilization's past, the universe's past. All of it too painful to recall. How did you get to be like this? Wong searched in his pocket and found some change. He bent over and dropped the money into the hat. Thank you, Mr. Copernicus. Let's hope that God doesn't abandon you. Though I don't have much faith in that. I feel that the model you and Newton and the others created in the East, with the help of the human formation computer, was very close to being correct. But the little bit of air left was like an uncrossable chasm for Newton and the others. I've always believed that without me, others would have discovered special relativity, eventually. But general relativity is different. The bit that Newton lacked was the effect on planetary orbit from the gravitationally induced curvature of space-time, described by general relativity. Though the error caused by it was small, its impact on the results of the computation was fatal. Adding the correction factor for perturbation from space-time curvature to the classical equations would yield the right mathematical model. The amount of computational power required far exceeds what you accomplished in the East, but is easily provided by modern computers. Have the results of the computation been confirmed by astronomical observations? If that had occurred, do you think I'd be here? But from the perspective of aesthetics, I must be right and the universe must be wrong. God abandoned me. Then others abandoned me as well. I'm wanted nowhere. Princeton dismissed me as a professor. UNESCO wouldn't even have me as a science consultant. Before, even if they had begged on their knees, I wouldn't have wanted the position. I even thought of going to Israel to be president. But they changed their minds and said I was nothing but a fraud. Einstein began playing again, picking up right where he had stopped. After listening to him for a while, Wong strode toward the UN building. There's no one in there, Einstein said, still playing. All the members of the General Assembly session are behind the building, attending the pendulum initiation ceremony. Wong walked around the building and was greeted by a breathtaking sight. A colossal pendulum that seemed to stretch between the sky and the earth. In fact, Wong had seen it peeking out from behind the building, but he didn't know what he was seeing. The pendulum resembled those constructed by Fu Si to hypnotize the sun god during the Warring States period, back when Wang Miao first logged on to Three Body. But the pendulum before him had been completely modernized. The two pillars holding up the pendulum were made of metal, each as tall as the Eiffel Tower. The weight was also made of metal, streamlined with a smooth, mirror-like, electroplated surface. The pendulum line, made of some ultra-strong material, was so thin as to be almost invisible, and the weight seemed to float in the air between the two towers. Below the pendulum was a crowd of people dressed in suits, probably the leaders of the various countries attending the General Assembly session. They gathered in small cliques and talked amongst themselves quietly, as though waiting for something. 
Ah, uh, Copernicus, the man who crossed five eras, someone shouted. The others welcomed him. You're one of those who saw the pendulums of the warring states period with your own eyes. A friendly man shook and held Wong's hand. Someone introduced the man as the Secretary General of the UN from Africa. Yes, I did see them, Wong said. But why are we building another one now? It's a monument for Trisolaris, as well as a tombstone. The Secretary General looked up at the pendulum. From down here, it appeared as big as a submarine. A tombstone? For who? For an aspiration. A striving that lasted through almost 200 civilizations. The effort to solve the three-body problem, to find a pattern in the sun's movements. Is the effort over? Yes. As of now, it's completely over. Wong hesitated for a moment before taking out a stack of papers. Wei Chang's three-body mathematical model. I... I, I came here for this. I brought a mathematical model that solves the three-body problem. I, I have reason to believe it will likely work. As soon as Wong said this, the crowd around him lost interest. They returned to their cliques to continue their conversations. He noticed that a few even shook their heads and laughed as they left him. The Secretary General took the document, and without even glancing at it, handed it to a slender man wearing glasses standing next to him. Out of respect for your fame and reputation, I'll have my science advisor take a look. Indeed, everyone here has shown you respect. If anyone else had said what you said, they'd be laughing at him. The science advisor flipped through the document. Evolutionary algorithm. Copernicus, you're a genius. Anyone who can come up with such an algorithm is a genius. This requires not only superior math skills, but also imagination. You seem to be suggesting that someone has already created such a mathematical model. Yes, there are dozens of other mathematical models. Of those, more than half are more advanced than yours. They've all been implemented and run on computers. During the past two centuries, such massive computation became the principal activity of this world. Everyone waited for the results, as if waiting for Judgment Day. And? We have definitively proven that the three-body problem has no solution. Wong gazed up at the massive pendulum overhead. In the dawn light, it was crystal bright. Its deformed, mirror-like surface reflected everything around it like the eye of the world. In this place, in a distant age, separated from the here and now by many civilizations, he and King Wen had passed through a forest of giant pendulums on their way to the palace of King Zhou. Just like that, history had made a long circuit and returned to its starting place. The science advisor said, It's just like we guessed long ago. The three-body system is a chaotic system. Tiny perturbations can be endlessly amplified. Its patterns of movement essentially cannot be mathematically predicted. Wong felt his scientific knowledge and system of thought become a blur in a single moment. In their place was unprecedented confusion. If an extremely simple arrangement like the three-body system is unpredictable chaos, how can we have any faith in discovering the laws of the complicated universe? God is a shameless old gambler. He has abandoned us. The speaker was Einstein, waving his violin. Wong didn't know when he had shown up. The secretary general slowly nodded. Yes, God is a gambler. The only hope for Trisolaran civilization is to gamble as well. By now, the giant moon was rising again from the dark side of the horizon. Its large, silvery image was reflected by the surface of the pendulum weight. The light wriggled strangely, as though the weight and the moon had developed a mysterious sympathy together. This civilization seems to have developed to a very advanced state, Wong said. Yes, we've mastered the energy of the atom and reached the information age. The Secretary General didn't seem to be too impressed by his own words. Then there is hope. Even if it's impossible to know the pattern of the sun's movements, civilization can continue to develop until it reaches a stage where it can survive the chaotic eras by protecting itself against the devastating catastrophes of those eras. People once thought as you do. That was one of the motivating forces pushing Trisolaran civilization to tenaciously come back again and again. But the moon made us realize the naivete of such an idea. The Secretary General pointed to the rising giant moon. 
this is probably the first time you've seen this moon. Actually, since it's about a quarter of the size of our planet, it's no longer a moon, but a companion to our world in a double planet system. It resulted from the Great Rip. The Great Rip? The disaster that destroyed the last civilization. Compared to the civilizations before it, they had ample warning of the disaster. Based on surviving records, the astronomers of Civilization 191 detected a frozen flying star early on. Wong's heart clenched as he heard the last phrase. A frozen flying star was a terrible omen for Trisolaris. When a flying star or a distant sun seems to come to a complete stop against the background star field, then the sun's and the planet's motion vectors are aligned. This has three possible interpretations. The sun and the planet are moving in the same direction at the same speed. The sun and the planet are moving apart from each other. And the sun and the planet are moving toward each other. Before Civilization 191, this last possibility was purely theoretical, a disaster that had never occurred. But the population's fear of it and their vigilance did not diminish, so much so that frozen flying star became an extremely unlucky phrase in many trisolaran civilizations. A single flying star remaining still was sufficient to terrify everyone. And then, three flying stars froze simultaneously. The people of Civilization 191 stood on the ground, gazing up helplessly at the three frozen flying stars, at the three suns falling directly toward their world. A few days later, one of the suns moved to a distance where its outer gaseous layer became visible. In the middle of a tranquil night, the star suddenly turned into a blazing sun. Separated by intervals of 30 hours or so, the other two suns also appeared in quick succession. This was not a normal kind of trisolar day. By the time the last flying star turned into a sun, the first sun had already swept past the planet at extremely close range. Right after that, the other two suns swept past Trisolaris at even closer ranges, where within the planet Roche limit. Such that the tidal forces imposed on Trisolaris by the three suns exceeded the force of the planet's gravitational self-attraction. The first sun shook the deepest geological structure of the planet. The second sun tore open a great rift in the planet that went straight to the core, and the third sun ripped the planet into two pieces. The Secretary General pointed at the giant moon overhead. That's the smaller piece. There are still ruins from Civilization 191 on it, but it's a lifeless world. It was the most terrible disaster in the entire history of Trisolaris. After the planet was torn apart, the two irregularly shaped pieces each returned to spherical form under self-gravitation. The dense, searing planetary core material gushed to the surface, and the oceans boiled over the lava. The continents drifted over the magma like icebergs. As they collided, the ground became as soft as the ocean. Massive mountain ranges, tens of thousands of meters high, rose in an hour and disappeared just as quickly. For a while, the two ripped apart pieces were still connected by streams of molten lava that coalesced into a space-spanning river. Then the lava cooled and turned into rings around the planets. But because of perturbations from the planets, the rings were unstable. The rocks that formed them fell back to the surface in a rain of giant stones that lasted several centuries. Can you imagine what kind of hell that was? The ecological destruction caused by this catastrophe was the most severe in all of history. All life on the companion planet went extinct, and the mother planet almost became a lifeless waste as well. But in the end, the seeds of life managed to germinate here. And as the geology of the mother planet settled down, evolution began its stuttering steps in new oceans and on new continents, until civilization reappeared for the 192nd time. The entire process took 90 million years. Trisolaris's place in the universe is even more grim than we had imagined. What will happen the next time frozen flying stars occur? Very likely. Our planet will not just skim past the edge of the sun, but will plunge into the fiery sea of the sun itself. Given enough time, this possibility will become certainty. This was originally just a frightening speculation, but a recent astronomical discovery has caused us to lose all hope for the fate of Trisolaris. The researchers had intended to recover the history of the formation of the stars and the planets based on signs in this stellar system. Instead, they discovered that in the distant past, the Trisolaran stellar system had 12 planets. Yet, now only this one remains. 
there is only one explanation. The other 11 planets have all been consumed by the three suns. Our world is nothing more than the sole survivor of a great hunt. The fact that civilization has been reincarnated 192 times is only a kind of luck. Also, after further study, we discovered the phenomenon of breathing by the three stars. The stars breathe? It's only a metaphor. You discovered the gaseous outer layer of the suns, but you didn't know that this gaseous layer expands and contracts over cycles lasting eons, like breathing. When the gaseous layer expands, its thickness can grow by more than a dozen times. This greatly increases the diameter of the sun, like a giant mitt that can catch planets more easily. When a planet passes by a sun at close range, it will enter the sun's gaseous layer. Friction will cause it to lose speed. And finally, like a meteor, it'll fall into the blazing sea of the sun, dragging a long, fiery tail. The study results show that in the long history of the Trisolarian stellar system, every time the sun's gaseous layers expanded, one or two planets were consumed. The other eleven planets all fell into a fiery sea during times when the gaseous layers were at their greatest. Right now, the gaseous layers of the three suns are in a contracted stage. Otherwise, our planet would have already fallen into one of them the last time they skimmed past. But, scholars predict that the next expansion will occur in 1000 years. We can't stay in this terrible place anymore. Einstein said, crouched down on the ground like an old beggar. The Secretary General nodded. We can't stay here any longer. The only path left for Trisolar and civilization is to gamble with the universe. How? Wong asked. We must leave the Trisolar and Stellar system and fly into the wide open sea of stars. We must find in the galaxy a new world to emigrate to. Wong heard a grinding noise. He saw that the giant weight of the pendulum was being pulled up by a thin cable whose other end was attached to an elevated winch. As it rose to its highest point, a great waning crescent moon descended slowly in the sky behind it. The Secretary General solemnly announced, Start the pendulum. The elevated winch released the cable tied to the pendulum, and the weight noiselessly fell along a smooth arc. Initially it fell slowly, but then it accelerated, reaching maximum speed at the bottom of the arc. As it sliced through the air, the sound of the wind was deep and resonant. By the time the noise disappeared, the pendulum had followed the arc to its highest point on the other side, and after pausing for a moment, began its backward swing. Wong felt the great force generated by the movement of the pendulum, as though the ground was shaken by its swings. Unlike a pendulum in the real world, this giant pendulum's period was not stable, but changed constantly. This was due to the continually shifting gravitational attraction of the giant moon. When the giant moon was on this side of the planet, its gravity partially cancelled out the gravity of the planet, causing the pendulum to lose weight. When it was on the other side of the planet, its gravity was added to the gravity of the planet, causing the pendulum's weight to increase, almost to the level it would have had before the Great Rip. As he gazed up at the awe-inspiring swings of the Trisolaran Pendulum Monument, Wong asked himself, Does it represent the yearning for order, or the surrender to chaos? Wong also thought of the pendulum as a gigantic metal fist, swinging eternally against the unfeeling universe, noiselessly shouting out Trisolaran civilization's indomitable battle cry. As Wong Miao's eyes blurred with tears, he saw a line of text appear against the background of the swinging pendulum. 451 years later, Civilization 192 was destroyed by the fiery flames of twin suns appearing together. It had reached the Atomic Age and the Information Age. Civilization 192 was a milestone in Trisolaran civilization. It finally proved that the three-body problem had no solution. It gave up the useless effort that had already lasted through 191 cycles and set the course for future civilizations. Thus, the goal of three body has changed. The new goal is, head for the stars, find a new home. We invite you to log on again. After logging out of three body, Wong felt exhausted, the same way he did after each previous session. But this time, he only rested half an hour before logging in again. This time, against the pitch-black background, an unexpected line of text appeared. 
The situation is urgent. The three body servers are about to be shut down. Please log on freely during the remaining time. Three body will now go directly to the final scene. 20. Three body. Expedition. The chilly dawn revealed a bare landscape. There was no pyramid. No United Nations headquarters. No sign of the pendulum monument. Only a dark desert extended to the horizon, just as Juan had seen the first time he had logged in. But Juan soon realized that he was wrong. What he thought were numerous stones arrayed across the desert were not stones at all, but human heads. The ground was filled with a densely packed crown. From where he stood on a small hill, Juan could see no end to the sea of people. He estimated the number of individuals within his view alone to be in the hundreds of millions. All the Trisolarans on the planet were probably gathered here. The silence of hundreds of millions created a suffocating sense of strangeness. What are they waiting for? Wong looked around and noticed everyone was gazing up at the sky. Wong lifted his face and found the starry sky had been transformed to an astonishing sight. The stars were arrayed in a square formation. However, Wong soon realized that the stars in the formation were in a synchronous orbit above the planet, moving together against the dimmer, more distant background of the Milky Way. The stars in the formation closest to the direction of dawn were also the brightest, shining with the silver light that cast shadows on the ground. The brightness decreased as one moved away from that edge. Wong counted more than 30 stars along each edge of the formation, which meant a total of more than a thousand stars. The slow movement of the obviously artificial formation against the starry universe exuded a solemn power. A man standing next to him nudged him lightly and spoke in a low voice. Ah, uh, great Copernicus, why have you come so late? Three cycles of civilization have passed, and you've missed many great enterprises. What is that? Wong asked, pointing at the formation in the sky. The Trisolaran Interstellar Fleet. It's about to begin its expedition. Trisolaran civilization has already achieved the capacity for interstellar flight? Yes. All those magnificent ships can reach one-tenth the speed of light. That is a great accomplishment, as far as I understand it. But it still seems too slow for interstellar flight. The journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. The key is finding the right target. What's the fleet's destination? A star with planets about four light years away. The closest star to the Trisolaran system. Wong was surprised. The closest star to us is also about four light years away. You. The Earth. Oh. That's not very surprising. In most regions of the Milky Way the distribution of stars is fairly even. It's the result of star clusters acting under the influence of gravity. The distance between most stars is between three and six light years. A loud joyous cry erupted from the crowd. Wong looked up and saw that every star in the square formation was rapidly growing brighter. This was due to the light emitted by the ships themselves. Their combined illumination soon overwhelmed the dawn, and 1,000 stars became 1,000 little suns. Trisolaris was bathed in glorious daylight, and the crowd raised their hands and formed an endless prairie of uplifted arms. The Trisolaran fleet began to accelerate, solemnly gliding across the dome of the sky, skimming past the giant just-risen moon's tip, casting a dim blue glow against the moon's mountains and plains. The joyous cry subsided. The people of Trisolaris mutely gazed as their hope gradually shrunk in the western sky. They would not know the outcome of the launch in their lifetimes, but four or five hundred years from now, their descendants would receive the news from a new world, the beginning of a new life for Trisolaran civilization. Wong stood with them, silently gazing, until the phalanx of a thousand stars shrank into a single star, yeah. and until that star disappeared in the western night sky. Then, the following text appeared. The Trisolaran expedition to the New World has begun. The fleet is still in flight. Three body is over. When you have returned to the real world, if you remain true to the promise you've made, 
please attend the meetup of the Earth Trisolaris organization. The address will be in the follow-up email you receive. Part 3. Sunset for Humanity 21. Rebels of Earth There were many more attendees this time than at the last three body meetup. They met at the employee cafeteria of a chemical plant. The factory had already been moved elsewhere, and the interior of the building, which was about to be demolished, was worn out but spacious. About 300 people were gathered here, and Wang Miao noticed many familiar faces. Celebrities and elites of various fields, famous scientists, writers, politicians, and so on. The first thing to attract Wang's attention was the strange device at the center of the cafeteria. Three silver spheres, each slightly smaller than a bowling ball, hovered and swirled over a metal base. Wong guessed the device was probably based on magnetic levitation. The orbits of the three spheres were completely random, a real-life version of the three-body problem. The others didn't pay much attention to the artistic portrayal of the three-body problem. Instead, they focused on Pan Han, who was standing on top of a broken table in the middle of the cafeteria. Did you murder comrade Shen Yufei? A man asked. Yes, Pan said perfectly calm. It's because the Adventists have traitors like her in our midst that the organization faces the crisis it does today. Who gave you the right to kill? I did it out of a sense of duty to the organization. Duty? I think you've always had malice in your heart. What do you mean by that? What is the environment branched on under your leadership? Your charge is to exploit and create environmental problems to make the population loathe science and modern industry. But in reality, you've only used our Lord's technology and predictions to gain riches and fame for yourself. Do you think I became famous for myself? To my eyes, the entire human race is a pile of garbage. Why would I care what they think? But if I'm not famous, how do I direct and channel their thinking? You always pick the easy tasks. What you've done could have been better accomplished by regular environmentalists. They're more sincere and passionate than you, and with just a little guidance, we could easily take advantage of their actions. Your environment branch should be creating environmental disasters and then exploiting them. For example, disseminating poison in reservoirs, leaking toxic waste from chemical plants. Have you done any of those? No, not a single one. We had devised numerous programs and plans, but the commander vetoed them all. Anyway, such acts would have been stupid, at least until recently. The biology and medicine branch once created a catastrophe from the overuse of antibiotics, but that was soon detected and the rash actions of the European detachment almost drew attention to us. Talk about drawing attention to us. You just murdered someone. Listen to me, comrades. Sooner or later it would have been unavoidable. You must already know that the governments of the world are preparing for war. In Europe and North America, they're already cracking down on the organization. Once the crackdown begins here, the Redemptionists will no doubt side with the government. So our first priority is to purge the Redemptionists from the organization. That is not within your authority. Of course the commander must decide. But, comrades, I can tell you right now that the commander is an Adventist. Now you're just making things up. Everyone knows the scope of the commander's power. If the commander really is an Adventist, then the Redemptionists would have been purged long ago. Maybe the commander knows something we don't. Perhaps that's what the meeting today is about. After this, the crowd's attention turned away from Pan Han to the crisis before them. A famous scientist who had won the Turing Award jumped onto the table and began to speak. The time for talk is over. Comrades, which should be our next step. Start a global rebellion, then we're asking to be killed. Long live the spirit of Trisolaris. We shall persevere like the stubborn grass that resprouts after every wildfire. 
our rebellion will finally reveal our existence to the world. As long as we have an appropriate plan of action, I'm sure many people will support us. This last remark came from Pan Han, and many applauded. Someone yelled, the commander is here. The crowd parted to form a path. Wong looked up and felt dizzy. The world turned white and black in his eyes, and the only spot of color was the person who had just appeared. Surrounded by a group of young bodyguards, the commander-in-chief of the Earth Trisolaris Rebels, Yao Wintsia, walked steadily into the crowd. Yao stood in the middle of the space the crowd cleared for, raised a bony fist, and, with a resolve and strength that Wong could not believe she possessed, said, Eliminate human tyranny! The crowd responded in a way that had clearly been rehearsed countless times. The world belongs to Trisolaris. Hello, comrades. Yeah, said. Her voice returned to the gentleness that Wong knew. It was only now that he could be sure that it was really her. I haven't been well lately, and haven't spent much time with all of you. But now the situation is urgent and I know everyone is under a great deal of pressure. So I've come to see you. Commander, take care of yourself, someone in the crowd said. Wong could hear the heartfelt concern. Yeah, said. Before we move on to more important matters, let's take care of one small detail. Han Han! She kept her eyes on the crowd even as she called his name. Here, Commander. Han emerged from the crowd. Earlier he had tried to lose himself in the throng. He appeared calm, but the terror in his heart was obvious. The commander had not called him comrade. A bad sign. You committed a severe violation of the organization's rules. Yeah spoke without looking at Pond. Her voice remained kind, as though talking to a child who had been naughty. Commander! The organization is facing a crisis of survival. If we don't take decisive measures and cleanse the traitors and enemies within, we will lose everything. Yeah looked up at Pawn, her eyes affectionate. But his breath stopped for a few seconds. The ultimate goal and ideal of the ETO is to lose everything. Everything that now belongs to the human race, including us. Then you must be an Adventist, Commander. Please openly declare this to be true because it's very important. Am I right, comrades? Very important! He shouted and waved an arm as he looked around. But the crowd remained mute. This request is not yours to make. You have seriously violated our code of conduct. If you want to make an appeal, now is the time. Otherwise, you must bear the responsibility. Yes, yeah, spoke slowly, enunciating every word, as though afraid the child she was teaching had trouble understanding. I went intending to eliminate Wei Cheng, that math prodigy, the decision was made by Comrade Evans and ratified by the committee unanimously. If he really succeeds in creating a mathematical model of the three-body problem that gives a complete solution, our Lord will not come, and the great enterprise of Trisolaris on Earth will be ruined. I only shot at Shen Yufei since she shot at me first. I was acting in self-defense. Yeah, I nodded. Let us believe you. This is, after all, not the most important issue. I hope we can continue to trust you. Now, please repeat the request you made to me just now. Pawn was stunned for a second. That she had moved on didn't seem to relax him. I ask that you openly declare yourself to be an Adventist. After all, the action plan of the Adventists is also your ideal. Then repeat the plan of action. A human society can no longer rely on its own power to solve its problems. It can also no longer rely on its own power to restrain its madness. Therefore, we ask our Lord to come to this world and with its power forcefully watch over us and transform us so as to create a brand new 
perfect human civilization. Are the Adventists loyal believers in this plan? Of course! Commander please do not believe false rumors. It's not a false rumor! A man shouted. He made his way to the front. I am Raphael, from Israel. Three years ago my 14 year old son died in an accident. I had his kidney donated to a Palestinian girl suffering kidney failure as an expression of my hope that the two peoples could live together in peace. For this ideal I was willing to give my life. Many, many Israelis and Palestinians sincerely strove toward the same goal by my side. But all this was useless. Our home remained trapped in the quagmire of cycles of vengeance. Eventually I lost hope in the human race and joined the ETO. Desperation turned me from a pacifist into an extremist. Also probably because I donated so much money to the organization, I became a core member of the Adventists. Let me tell you now, the Adventists have their own secret agenda. And it is this. The human race is an evil species. Human civilization has committed unforgivable crimes against the earth and must be punished. The ultimate goal of the Adventists is to ask our Lord to carry out this divine punishment. The destruction of all humankind. The real program of the Adventists is already an open secret, someone shouted. But what you don't know is that this was not a program they evolved into. It was the goal set out at the very beginning. It's been the lifelong dream of Mike Evans, the mastermind behind the Adventists. He lied to the organization and fooled everyone, including the commander. Evans has been working toward this goal from the very start. He turned the Adventists into a kingdom of terror, populated by extreme environmentalists and madmen who hated the human race. I didn't know Evans' real thoughts until much later, yeah said. Still, I tried to patch over the differences to allow the ETO to remain whole. But some of the other pacts committed by Adventists lately have made the effort impossible. Pawn said, Commander, the Adventists are the core of ETO. Without us, there is no Earth Trisolaris movement. But this is no excuse for you to monopolize all communications between our Lord and the organization. We built the second Red Coast base. Of course we should operate it. The Adventists took advantage of this and committed an unforgivable betrayal of the organization. You intercepted the messages from our Lord to the organization and passed on only a small portion of them, even those you distorted. Also, through the second Red Coast base, you sent a large amount of information to our Lord without the organization's approval. Silence descended over the meeting like a monstrous thing. Wong's scalp began to tingle. Han did not answer. His expression became cold, as if to say, finally, it has happened. There is much evidence of the Adventists' betrayal. Comrade Shen Yufei was one of the witnesses. Though she belonged to the core group of Adventists, in her heart she remained a resolute redemptionist. You only discovered this recently, and she already knew too much. When Evan sent you, he wanted you to kill two people. Not one. Khan looked around, apparently reassessing the situation. His gesture didn't go unnoticed by Yen. You can see that most people attending this meeting are comrades from the Redemptionist faction. I trust that the few Adventists who are here will stand on the side of the organization. But men like Evans and you can no longer be saved. To protect the program and ideals of the ETO, we must completely solve the problem of the Adventists. Silence returned. A few moments later, one of the bodyguards near Ya, a young woman, smiled. She walked toward Pan Han casually. Pan's face changed. He stuck a hand inside the lapel of his jacket, but the young woman dashed quicker than the eye could follow. Before anyone could react, she wrapped one of her slender arms around Pan's neck placed her other hand on top of his head, and by applying her unexpected strength at just the right angle, she twisted Pon's head 180 degrees, with practiced ease. 
the cracks from his cervical vertebrae breaking, stood out against the complete silence. The young woman's hands immediately let go, as though Pawn's head was too hot. Pawn fell to the ground, and the gun that had killed Shen Yufei slid under the table. His body still spasmed, and his eyes remained open, his tongue sticking out. But his head no longer moved, as though it were never a part of the rest of his body. Several men came and dragged him away, the blood oozing from his mouth leaving a long trail. Ah! Thiao Long! You're here too! How have you been? Yao's gaze fell on Wang Miao. She smiled kindly at him and nodded. Then she turned to the others. This is Professor Wong, a member of the Chinese Academy of Sciences, and my friend. He researches nanomaterials. This is the first technology our Lord wishes to extinguish from the Earth. No one looked at Wong, and Wong had no strength to express himself in any way. He had to pull at the sleeve of the man next to him so that he wouldn't fall. But the man lightly brushed his hand away. Xiao so, Wong, why don't I continue to tell you the story of Red Coast from the last time? All the comrades here can listen to. This is not a waste of time. In this extraordinary moment, it is a fine time to review the history of our organization. Red Coast? You weren't done? Wong asked foolishly. Yeah, slowly approached the three-body model, seemingly absorbed by the swirling silver spheres. Through the broken window, the setting sun's light fell on the model, and the flying spheres intermittently reflected the light onto the rebel commander, like sparks from a bonfire. No. I've only just started. Yeah, said softly. 22. Red Coast 5 Since she had entered Red Coast base, Yao and Sia had never thought of leaving. After she learned the real purpose of the Red Coast project, top secret information that even many mid-level cadres at the base didn't know, she cut off her spiritual connection to the outside world, and devoted herself to her work. Thereafter, she became even more deeply embedded in the technical core of Red Coast, and began to take on more important research topics. Commissar Lei never forgot that it was Chief Yang who first trusted Yao, but Lei was happy to assign important topics to her. Given Yao's status, she had no rights to the results of her research, and Lei, who had studied astrophysics, was a political officer who was also an intellectual, rare at the time. Thus, he could take credit for all of Yao's research results and papers, and cast himself as an exemplary political officer with both technical acumen and revolutionary zeal. The Red Coast Project had initially requisitioned Yao because of a paper on an attempted mathematical model of the Sun she had published in the Journal of Astrophysics as a graduate student. Compared to the Earth, the Sun was a far simpler physical system, made almost entirely of hydrogen and helium. Though its physical processes were violent, they were relatively straightforward, only fusing hydrogen into helium. Thus, it was likely that a mathematical model of the Sun could describe it rather precisely. The paper was basic, but Lei and Yang saw in it a hope for a solution to a technical difficulty faced by the Red Coast monitoring system. Solar outages, a common problem in satellite communications, had always plagued the Red Coast monitoring operations. When the Earth, an artificial satellite, and the Sun are in a straight line, the line of sight from the ground-based antenna to the satellite will have the Sun as its background. The sun is a giant source of electromagnetic radiation, and, as a result, satellite transmissions to the ground will be overwhelmed by interference from the solar radiation. This problem could not be completely solved, even in the 21st century. The interference that Red Coast had to deal with was similar, but the source of interference, the sun, was between the source of the transmission, outer space, and the ground-based receiver. Compared to communication satellites, the solar outages suffered by Red Coast were more frequent and more severe. Red Coast base as constructed was also much more modest than its original design, such that the transmission and monitoring systems shared the same antenna. Yeah. This made the times available for monitoring even more precious, and solar outages even more of a problem. Lei and Yang's idea for eliminating interference was very simple. Ascertain the frequency spectrum and characteristics of solar radiation in the monitored range, and then filter it out digitally. 
Both of them were technical, and at that time when the ignorant often led the knowledgeable, that was a rare bit of fortune. But Yang wasn't a specialist in astrophysics, and Lei had taken the path of becoming a political officer, which prevented him from accruing in-depth technical know-how. In reality, electromagnetic radiation from the sun is only stable within the limited range from near-ultraviolet to mid-infrared, including visible light. In other ranges, the radiation is quite volatile and unpredictable. To set the right expectations, Ya made it clear in her first research report that during periods of intense solar activity, sunspots, solar flares, coronal mass ejections and so on, it was impossible to eliminate solar interference. Thus, her research target was limited to radiation within the frequency ranges monitored by Red Coast during periods of normal solar activity. Research conditions at the base weren't too bad, the library could obtain foreign language materials related to the topic, including timely European and American academic journals. In those years, this was no easy feat. Ya yeah, also could use the military phone line to connect to the two groups conducting solar science research within the Chinese Academy of Sciences and obtain their observation data by fax. After half a year of study, Ya yeah saw no glimpse of hope. She quickly discovered that within the frequency ranges monitored by Red Coast, solar radiation fluctuated unpredictably. By analyzing large amounts of observed data, Ya yeah discovered a puzzling mystery. Sometimes, during one of the sudden fluctuations in solar radiation, the surface of the sun was calm. Since hundreds of thousands of kilometers of solar material would absorb any shortwave and microwave radiation originating from the core of the sun, the radiation must have come from activities on its surface. So there should have been observable surface activity when these fluctuations occurred. If there were no corresponding surface disturbances, what caused these sudden changes to the narrow frequency ranges? The more she thought about it, the more mysterious it seemed. Eventually, Ya yeah ran out of ideas and decided to give up. In her last report, she conceded that she could not solve the problem. This shouldn't have been a big deal. The military had asked several groups within universities and the Chinese Academy of Sciences to research the same issue, and all of those efforts had failed. But Yang wanted to try one more time, relying on Ya's extraordinary talent. Lei's agenda was even simpler. He just wanted Ya's paper. The research topic was highly theoretical and would show off his expertise and skill. Now that the chaos in society was finally subsiding, the demands on cadres were also changing. There was an acute need for men like him, politically mature and academically accomplished. Of course, he would have a bright future. As to whether the problem of interference from solar outages could be solved, he didn't really care. But in the end, Ya didn't hand in her report. She thought that if the research project were terminated, the base library would stop receiving foreign language journals and other research materials, and she would no longer have access to such a rich trove of astrophysics references. So she nominally continued her research, while in reality she focused on refining her mathematical model of the sun. One night, Ya yeah was, as usual, the only person in the cold reading room of the base library. On the long table in front of her, a pile of documents and journals were spread open. After completing a set of tedious and cumbersome matrix calculations, she blew on her hands to warm them and picked up the latest issue of the Journal of Astrophysics to take a break. As she flipped through it, a brief note about Jupiter caught her attention. Last issue, in a new, powerful radiation source within the solar system, Dr. Harry Peterson of Mount Wilson Observatory published a set of data accidentally obtained while observing Jupiter's precession on June 12th and July 2nd, during which strong electromagnetic radiation was detected, lasting 81 seconds and 76 seconds, respectively. The data included the frequency ranges of the radiation as well as other parameters. During the radio outbursts, Peterson also observed certain changes in the Great Red Spot, this discovery drew a lot of interest from planetary scientists. In this issue, G. McKenzie's article argues that it was a sign of fusion starting within Jupiter's core. In the next issue, we will publish Inoue Kumaseki's article, which attributes the Jovian radio outbursts to a more complicated mechanism, the movements of internal metallic hydrogen plates, and gives a complete mathematical description. Yeah, clearly remembered the two dates noted in the paper. During those windows, the Red Coast monitoring system had also received strong interference from solar outages. She checked the operations diary and confirmed her memory. 
The times were close, but the solar outages had occurred 16 minutes and 42 seconds after the arrival of the Jovian radio outbursts on Earth. The 16 minutes and 42 seconds are critical. Yeah, try to calm her wild heartbeat and ask the librarian to contact the National Observatory to obtain the ephemeris of the Earth's and Jupiter's positions during those two time periods. She drew a big triangle on the blackboard with the Sun, the Earth, and Jupiter at the vertices. She marked the distances along the three edges and wrote down the two arrival times next to the Earth. From the distance between the Earth and Jupiter, it was easy to figure out the time it took for the radio outbursts to travel between the two. Then she calculated the time it would take the radio outbursts to go from Jupiter to the Sun, and then from the Sun to the Earth. The difference between the two was exactly 16 minutes and 42 seconds. Yeah referred to her solar structure mathematical model and tried to find a theoretical explanation. Her eyes were drawn to her description of what she called energy mirrors within the solar radiation zone. Energy produced by reaction within the solar core is initially in the form of high energy gamma rays. The radiation zone, the region of the sun's interior that surrounds the core, absorbs these high energy photons and re-emits them at a slightly lower energy level. After a long period of successive absorption and re-emission, a photon might take a thousand years to leave the sun. Gamma rays become X-rays, extreme, ultraviolet, ultraviolet, then eventually turn into visible light and other forms of radiation. Such were the known facts about the sun. But Yaz's model led to a new result. As solar radiation dropped through these different frequencies on its way through the radiation zone, there were boundaries between the subzones for each type of radiation. As energy crossed each boundary, the radiation frequency stepped down a grade sharply. This was different from the traditional view that the radiation frequency lowered gradually as energy passed from the core outwards. Her calculations showed that these boundaries would reflect radiation coming from the lower frequency side, which was why she named the boundaries energy mirrors. Yeah had carefully studied these membrane-like boundary surfaces suspended in the high-energy plasma ocean of the Sun, and discovered them to be full of wonderful properties. One of the most incredible characteristics she named gain reflectivity. However, the characteristic was so bizarre that it was hard to confirm, and even Yaa herself didn't quite believe it was real. It seemed more likely an artifact of some error in the dizzying complex calculations. But now Yaa made the first step in confirming her guess about the gain reflectivity of solar energy mirrors. The energy mirrors not only reflected radiation coming from the lower frequency side, but amplified it. All the mysterious sudden fluctuations within narrow frequency bands that she had observed were in fact the result of other radiation coming through space being amplified after reflecting off an energy mirror in the sun. That was why there were no observable disturbances on the surface of the sun. This time, after the Jovian radio outbursts reached the sun, they were re-emitted as if by a mirror after being amplified about a hundred million times. The Earth received both sets of emissions, before and after the amplification, separated by 16 minutes and 42 seconds. The Sun was an amplifier for radio waves. However, there was a question. The Sun must be receiving electromagnetic radiation from space every second, including radio waves emitted by the Earth. Why were only some of the waves amplified? The answer was simple. In addition to the selectivity of the energy mirrors for frequencies they would reflect, the main reason was the shielding effect of the solar convection zone. The endlessly boiling convection zone situated outside the radiation zone was the outermost liquid layer of the sun. The radio waves coming from space must first penetrate the convection zone to reach the energy mirrors in the radiation zone, where they would be amplified and reflected back out. This meant that in order to reach the energy mirrors, the waves would have to be more powerful than a threshold value. The vast majority of Earth-based radio sources could not cross this threshold, but the Jovian radio outburst did. And, Red Coast's maximum transmission power also exceeded the threshold. The problem with solar outages was not resolved, but another exciting possibility presented itself. Humans could use the sun as a super antenna, and, through it, broadcast radio waves to the universe. The radio waves would be sent with the power of the sun, hundreds of millions of times greater than the total usable transmission power on Earth. Earth civilization had a way to transmit at the level of a Kardashev Type II civilization. 
The next step was to compare the waveforms of the two Jovian radio outbursts with the waveforms of the solar outages received by Red Coast. If they matched, then our guests would receive further confirmation. Yeah made a request to the base leadership to contact Harry Peterson and obtain the waveform records of the two Jovian radio outbursts. This was not easy. It was difficult to find the right communication channels and numerous bureaucracies required layers of formal paperwork. Any error could lead to her being suspected of acting as a foreign spy. So, Yeah had to wait. But there was a more direct way to prove the hypothesis. Red Coast itself could transmit radio waves directly at the sun at a power level exceeding the threshold value. Yeah again made a request to the base leadership, but she didn't dare to give her real reason. It was too fantastic and she would have been turned down for certain. Instead, she explained that she wanted to do an experiment for her solar research. The Red Coast transmission system would be used as a solar exploration radar whose echoes could be analyzed to obtain some information about solar radiation. Lei and Yang both had deep technical backgrounds and wouldn't have been easily fooled, but the experiment described by Yat did have real precedence in Western solar research. In fact, her suggestion was technically easier than the radar exploration of terrestrial planets already being conducted. What? Yeah, Wencia, you're getting out of line, said Commissar Lei. Your research should be focused on theory. Do we really need to go to so much trouble? Yeah, begged. Commissar, it's possible that a big discovery will be made. Experiments are absolutely necessary. I just want to try it once, please. Hmm? Chief Yang said, Commissar Lei, maybe we should try once. It doesn't seem to be too difficult operationally. Receiving the echoes after transmission would take 10, 15 minutes. Lei said. Then, Red Coast has just enough time to switch from transmission mode to monitoring mode. Lei shook his head again. I know that it's technically and operationally feasible, but you, eh, Chief Young, you just lack the sensitivity for this kind of thing. You want to aim a super powerful radio beam at the red sun. Have you thought about the political symbolism of such an experiment? Young and Ya were both utterly stunned, but they did not think Lei's objection ridiculous. Just the opposite. They were horrified that they themselves had not thought of it. During those years, finding political symbolism in everything had reached absurd levels. The research reports Ye turned in had to be carefully reviewed by Lei, so that even technical terms related to the sun could be reportedly revised to remove political risk. Terms like sunspots were forbidden. An experiment that sent a powerful radio transmission at the sun could of course be interpreted in a thousand positive ways, but a single negative interpretation would be enough to bring political disaster on everyone. Lay's reason for refusing to allow the experiment was truly unassailable. Yeah didn't give up though, in fact, as long as she didn't take excessive risk, it wasn't difficult to accomplish her goal. The Red Coast transmitter was ultra-high powered, but all of its components were domestically produced during the Cultural Revolution. As the quality of the components was not up to par, the fault rate was very high. After every 15th transmission, the entire system had to be overhauled, and after each overhaul, there would be a test transmission. Few people attended these tests, and the targets and other parameters were arbitrarily selected. One time when she was on duty, Ya yeah, was assigned to work during one of the test transmissions after an overhaul. Because a test transmission omitted many operational steps, only Ya yeah and five others were present. Three of them were low-level operators who knew little about the principles behind the equipment. The remaining two were a technician and an engineer, both exhausted and not paying much attention after two days of overhaul work. Ya yeah first adjusted the test transmission power to exceed the threshold value for gain-reflective solar energy mirror theory, using the maximum power of the Red Coast transmission system. Then she set the frequency to the value most likely to be amplified by the energy mirror. And under the guise of testing the antenna's mechanical components, she aimed it at the setting sun in the west. The content of the transmission remained the same as usual. This was a clear afternoon in the autumn of 1971. Afterwards, Ya yeah recalled the event many times, but couldn't remember any special feelings, except anxiety, a desire for the transmission to be completed quickly. First, she was afraid to be discovered by her colleagues. 
Even though she had thought of some excuses, it was still unusual to use maximum power for a test transmission, because doing so would wear down the components. In addition the Red Coast Transmission System's positioning equipment was never designed to be aimed at the sun. Yeah, I could feel the eyepiece growing hot. If it burned out, she would be in real trouble. As the sun set slowly in the west, Yeah had to manually track it. The Red Coast antenna seemed like a giant sunflower at that moment, slowly turning to follow the descending sun. By the time the red light indicating transmission completion lit up, she was already soaked in sweat. She glanced around. The three operators at the control panel were shutting down the equipment piece by piece in accordance with the instructions in the operating manual. The engineer was drinking a glass of water in a corner of the control room, and the technician was asleep in his chair. No matter how historians and writers later tried to portray the scene, the reality at the time was completely prosaic. The transmission completed, Ya rushed out of the control room and dashed into Yang Weining's office. Catching her breath, she said, Tell the base station to begin monitoring the 12,000 MHz channel. What are we receiving? Chief Yang looked in surprise at Ya, strands of hair stuck to her sweaty face. Compared to the highly sensitive Red Coast monitoring system, the conventional military-grade radio, normally used by the base for communicating with the outside, was only a toy. Maybe we'll get something. There's no time to change the Red Coast system to monitoring mode. Normally, warming up and switching over to the monitoring system required a little more than 10 minutes, but right now the monitoring system was also being overhauled. Many modules had been taken apart and remained unassembled, rendering them inoperable in the short term. Yang stared at Ya for a few seconds, and then picked up the phone and ordered the communications office to follow Ya's direction. Given the low sensitivity of that radio, we can probably only receive signals from extraterrestrials on the moon. The signal comes from the sun, Ya said. Outside the window, the sun's edge was already approaching the mountains on the horizon, red as blood. You used Red Coast to send a signal to the sun? Yang asked anxiously. Yeah, nodded. Don't tell anyone else. This must never happen again. Never! Yang looked behind him to be sure there was no one at the door. Yeah, nodded again. What's the point? The echo wave must be extremely weak, far outside the sensitivity of a conventional radio. No. If my guess is right, we should get an extremely strong echo. It'll be more powerful than... I can hardly imagine. As long as the transmission power exceeds a certain threshold, the sun can amplify the signal a hundred millionfold. Yon looked at Ya strangely. Ya said nothing. They both waited in silence. Yon could clearly hear Ya's breath and heartbeat. He hadn't paid much attention to what she had said, but the feelings he had buried in his heart for many years resurfaced. He could only restrain himself, waiting. Twenty minutes later, Yang picked up the phone, called the communications office and asked a few simple questions. He put the phone down. They received nothing. Ya let out a long-held breath and eventually nodded. Mm -hmm. That American astronomer responded though. Yang took out a thick envelope covered with custom stamps and handed it to Ya. She tore the envelope open and scanned Harry Peterson's letter. The letter said that he had not imagined that there would be colleagues in China studying planetary electromagnetism, and that he wished to collaborate and exchange more information in the future. He had also sent two stacks of paper, the complete record of the waveforms of the radio outbursts from Jupiter. They were clearly photocopied from the long signal recording tape, and would have to be pieced together. Ya took the dozens of sheets of photocopier paper and started lining them up in two columns on the floor. Halfway through the effort, she gave up any hope. She was very familiar with the waveforms of the interference from the two solar outages. They didn't match these two. Ya slowly picked up the photocopies from the floor. Yang crouched down to help her. When he handed the stack of paper to this woman he loved with all his heart, he saw her smile. The smile was so sad that his heart trembled. What's wrong? He asked, not realizing that he had never spoken to her so softly. Nothing. I'm just... Waking up from a dream. Ya smiled again. She took the stack of photocopies and the envelope and left the office. She went back to her room, picked up her lunchbox and went to the cafeteria. Only monto buns and pickles were left and the cafeteria workers told her impatiently that they were closing. 
so she had no choice but to carry her lunchbox outside and walk next to the lip of the cliff, where she sat down on the grass to chew the cold manteau. The sun had already set. The greater Kingon Mountains were grey and indistinct, just like Yaz's life. In this grey life, a dream appeared especially colorful and bright. But one always awoke from a dream, just like the sun, which, though it would rise again, brought no fresh hope. In that moment, Yaz saw the rest of her life suffused with an endless greyness. With tears in her eyes, she smiled again, and continued to chew the cold manteau. Yeah, I didn't know that at that moment, the first cry that could be heard in space from civilization on Earth was already spreading out from the sun to the universe at the speed of light. A star-powered radio wave, like a majestic tide, had already crossed the orbit of Jupiter. Right then, at the frequency of 12,000 megahertz, the sun was the brightest star in the entire Milky Way. <laughs> 23. Red Coast 6. The next eight years were among the most peaceful of Yatwinsia's life. The horror experienced during the Cultural Revolution gradually subsided, and she was finally able to relax a little. The Red Coast project completed its testing and breaking in phases, settling down into routine operation. Fewer and fewer technical problems remained, and both work and life became regular. In peace, what had been suppressed by anxiety and fear began to reawaken. Yeah, found that the real pain had just begun. Nightmarish memories, like embers coming back to life, burned more and more fiercely, searing her heart. For most people, perhaps time would have gradually healed these wounds. After all, during the Cultural Revolution, many people suffered fates similar to hers, and compared to many of them, Yeah was relatively fortunate. But Ya yeah had the mental habits of a scientist, and she refused to forget. Rather, she looked with a rational gaze on the madness and hatred that had harmed her. Ya's yeah rational consideration of humanity's evil sign began the day she read Silent Spring. As she grew closer to Yan Wenin, he was able to get her many classics of foreign language philosophy and history under the guise of gathering technical research materials. The bloody history of humanity shocked her, and the extraordinary insights of the philosophers also led her to understand the most fundamental and secret aspects of human nature. Indeed, even on top of Radar Peak, a place the world almost forgot, the madness and irrationality of the human race were constantly on display. Yeah saw that the forest below the peak continued to fall to the deranged logging by her former comrades. Patches of bare earth grew daily, as though those parts of the greater Kingon Mountains had had their skin torn off. When those patches grew into regions and then into a connected whole, the few surviving trees seemed rather abnormal. To complete the slash and burn plan, fires were lit on the bare fields and Radar Peak became the refuge for birds escaping the fiery inferno. As the fires raged, the sorrowful cries of birds with singed feathers at the base never ceased. The insanity of the human race had reached its historical zenith. The Cold War was at its height. Nuclear missiles capable of destroying the Earth ten times over could be launched at a moment's notice, spread out among the countless missile silos dotting two continents, and hidden within ghost-like nuclear-powered ballistic missile submarines patrolling deep under the sea. A single Lafayette or Yankee-class submarine held enough warheads to destroy hundreds of cities and kill hundreds of millions. But most people continued their lives as if nothing was wrong. As an astrophysicist, Yeah was strongly against nuclear weapons. She knew this was a power that should belong only to the stars. She knew also that the universe had even more terrible forces. Black holes, antimatter and more. Compared to those forces, a thermonuclear bomb was nothing but a tiny candle. If humans obtained mastery over one of those other forces, the world might be vaporized in a moment. In the face of madness, rationality was powerless. Four years after entering Red Coast Base, Ya and Yang married. Yang truly loved her. For love, he gave up his future. The fiercest stage of the Cultural Revolution was over, and the political climate had grown somewhat milder. Yang wasn't persecuted exactly for his marriage. 
However, because he married a woman who had been deemed to be a counter-revolutionary, he was viewed as politically immature and lost his position as chief engineer. The only reason that he and his wife were allowed to stay on the base as ordinary technicians was because the base could not do without their technical skills. Yeah accepted Young's proposal, mainly out of gratitude. If he hadn't brought her into this safe haven in her most perilous moment, she would probably no longer be alive. Young was a talented man, cultured and with good taste. She didn't find him unpleasant, but her heart was like ashes from which the flame of love could no longer be lit. As she pondered human nature, Yao was faced with an ultimate loss of purpose and sank into another spiritual crisis. She had once been an idealist who needed to give all her talent to a great goal, but now she realized that all she had done was meaningless, and the future could not have any meaningful pursuits either. As this mental state persisted, she gradually felt more and more alienated from the world. She didn't belong. The sense of wandering in the spiritual wilderness tormented her. After she made a home with Yang, her soul became homeless. One night Yao was working the night shift. This was the loneliest time. In the deep silence of midnight, the universe revealed itself to its listeners as a vast desolation. What Ya disliked most was seeing the waves that slowly crawled across the display. A visual record of the meaningless noise Red Coast picked up from space. Ya felt this interminable wave was an abstract view of the universe. One end connected to the endless past, the other to the endless future. And in the middle, only the ups and downs of random chance. Without life, without pattern, the peaks and valleys at different heights like uneven grains of sand. The whole curve like a one-dimensional desert, made of all the grains of sand lined up in a row. Lonely, desolate, so long that it was intolerable. You could follow it and go forward or backward as long as you liked, but you'd never find the end. On this day, however, Ya saw something odd when she glanced at the waveform display. Even experts had a hard time telling with the naked eye whether a waveform carried information. But Ya was so familiar with the noise of the universe that she could tell that the wave that now moved in front of her eyes had something extra. The thin curve, rising and falling, seemed to possess a soul. She was certain that the radio signal before had been modulated by intelligence. She rushed to another terminal and checked the computer's rating of the signal's recognizability. A A A A A. Before this, no radio signal received by Red Coast ever garnered a recognizability rating above C. An A rating meant the likelihood that the transmission contained intelligent information was greater than 90%. A rating of AAAAA was a special, extreme case. It meant the received transmission used the exact same coding language as Red Coast's own outbound transmission. He had turned on the Red Coast deciphering system. The software attempted to decipher any signal whose recognizability rating was above B. During the entire time that the Red Coast project had been running, it had never been invoked even once in real use. Based on test data, deciphering a transmission suspected of being a message might require a few days or even a few months of computing time. And the result would be failure more than half the time. Yeah. But this time, as soon as the file containing the original transmission was submitted, the display showed that the deciphering was complete. Yeah, opened the resulting document, and for the first time, a human read a message from another world. The content was not what anyone had imagined. It was a warning, repeated three times. Do not answer, do not answer, do not answer. Still caught up by the dizzying excitement and confusion, Yeah deciphered a second message. This world has received your message. I am a pacifist in this world. It is the luck of your civilization that I am the first to receive your message. I am warning you, do not answer, do not answer, do not answer. There are tens of millions of stars in your direction. As long as you do not answer, this world will not be able to ascertain the source of your transmission. But if you do answer, the source will be located right away. Your planet will be invaded. Your world will be conquered. Do not answer. Do not answer. Do not answer. As she read the flashing green text on the display, Yeah was no longer capable of thinking clearly. Her mind, inhibited by shock and excitement, could only understand this. 
No more than nine years had passed since the time she had sent the message to the sun. Then the source of this transmission must be around four light years away. It could only have come from the closest extrasolar stellar system, Alpha Centauri. The universe was not desolate. The universe was not empty. The universe was full of life. Humankind had cast their gaze to the end of the universe, but they had no idea that intelligent life already existed around the stars closest to them. Yaz stared at the waveform display. The signal continued to stream from the universe into the Red Coast antenna. She opened up another interface and began real-time deciphering. The messages began to show up immediately on the screen. During the next four hours, Ya learned of the existence of Trisolaris, learned of the civilization that had been reborn again and again, and learned of their plan to migrate to the stars. At four in the morning, the transmission from Alpha Centauri ended. The deciphering system continued to run uselessly and emitted an unceasing string of failure codes. The Red Coast monitoring system was once again only hearing the noise of the universe. But yeah, I was certain that what she had just experienced was not a dream. The sun really was an amplifying antenna. But why had her experiment eight years ago not received any echoes? Why had the waveforms of Jupiter's radio outbursts not matched the later radiation from the sun? Later, yeah, came up with many reasons. It was possible that the base communication office couldn't receive radio waves at that frequency. Or maybe the office did receive the echo, but it sounded like noise, and so the operator thought it was nothing. As for the waveforms, it was possible that when the sun amplified the radio waves, it also added another wave to it. It would likely be a periodic wave that could be easily filtered out by the alien deciphering system. But to her unaided eye, the waveform from Jupiter and from the sun would appear very different. Years later, after he had left Red Coast, she would manage to confirm her last guess. The sun had added a sine wave. She looked around alertly. There were three others in the main computer room. Two of the three were chatting in a corner, while the last was napping before a terminal. In the data analysis section of the monitoring system, only the two terminals in front of her could view the recognizability rating of a signal and access the deciphering system. Maintaining her composure, she worked quickly and moved all of the received messages to a multiply encrypted invisible subdirectory. Then she copied over a segment of noise received a year ago as a substitute for the transmission received during the last five hours. Finally, from the terminal, she placed a short message into the Red Coast transmission buffer. <laughs> yeah, got up and left the monitoring main control room. A chilly wind blew against her feverish face. Dawn had just brightened the eastern sky, and she followed the dimly lit pebble-paved path to the transmission main control room. Above her, the Red Coast antenna lay open, silently, like a giant palm toward the universe. The dawn turned the guard at the door into a silhouette, and as usual, he did not pay attention to Yar as she entered. The transmission main control room was much dimmer than the monitoring main control room. Yeah passed through rows of cabinets to stand in front of the control panel and flip more than a dozen switches with practiced ease to warm up the transmission system. The two men on duty next to the control panel looked up at her with sleepy eyes, and one turned to glance at the clock. Then one of them went back to his nap while the other flipped through a well-thumbed newspaper. At the base, Yeah had no political status, but she did have some freedom in technical matters. She often tested the equipment before a transmission, Although she was early today, the transmission wasn't scheduled to occur until three hours later. Warming up a bit early wasn't that unusual. <clears throat> what happened next was the longest half hour of her life. During this time, Yeah adjusted the transmission frequency to the optimal frequency for amplification by the solar energy mirror, and increased the transmission power to maximum. Then, putting her eyes to the eyepiece of the optical positioning system, she watched the sun rise above the horizon activated the positioning system for the antenna, and slowly aligned it with the sun. As the gigantic antenna turned, the rumbling noise shook the main control room. One of the men on duty looked at Yeah again, but said nothing. The sun was now completely above the horizon. The crosshair of the Red Coast positioning system was aimed at its upper edge to account for the time it would take for the radio wave to travel to the sun. The transmission system was ready. The transmit button was a long rectangle, very similar to the space key on a computer keyboard, except that it was red. 
Yaz's hand hovered two centimeters above it. The fate of the entire human race was now tied to these slender fingers. Without hesitation, Yaz pressed the button. What are you doing? One of the men on duty asked, still sleepy. Yaz smiled at him and said nothing. She pressed a yellow button to stop the transmission, then she moved the control stick until the antenna was pointed elsewhere. She left the control panel and walked away. The man looked at his watch. It was time to get off work. He picked up the diary and thought about recording Yaz's operation of the transmission system. It was, after all, out of the ordinary. But then he looked at the paper tape and saw that she had transmitted for no more than three seconds. He tossed the diary back, yawned, put on his army cap, and left. The message that was winging its way to the sun said, Come here. I will help you conquer this world. Our civilization is no longer capable of solving its own problems. We need your force to intervene. A newly risen sun dazzled Yawintia. Not too far from the door of the main control room, she collapsed onto the lawn in a faint. When she woke up, she found herself in the base clinic. Next to her bed sat Yang, watching her with concern. Like that time many years ago on the helicopter. The doctor told Ya to be careful and get plenty of rest. You are pregnant, he said. 24. Rebellion. After Ya Wintsia finished recounting the history of her first contact with Trisolaris, the abandoned cafeteria remained silent. Many present were apparently just hearing the complete story for the first time. Wong was deeply absorbed by the narrative and temporarily forgot about the danger and terror he faced. Unable to stop himself, he asked, How did the ETO then develop to its present scale? Yeah, replied, I'd have to start with how I got to know Evans. But every comrade here already knows that part of history, so we shouldn't waste time on it now. I can tell you later. However, whether we'll have such an opportunity depends on you. Xiao Wong, let's talk about your nanomaterial. This uh, lord that you talk about, oh, why is it so afraid of nanomaterial? Because it can allow humans to escape gravity and engage in space construction at a much larger scale. The space elevator? Wong suddenly understood. Yes. If ultra-strong nanomaterials could be mass-produced, then that would lay the technical foundation for building a space elevator from the ground up to a geostationary point in space. For our Lord, this is but a tiny invention. But for humans on Earth, its meaning would be significant. With this technology, humans could easily enter near-Earth space and build up large-scale defensive structures. Thus, this technology must be extinguished. What is at the end of the countdown? Wong asked the question that frightened him the most. He yeah, asked smiled. I don't know. But trying to stop me is useless. This is not basic research. Based on what we've already found out, someone else can figure out the rest. Wong's voice was loud but anxious. Yes, it is rather useless. It's far more effective to confuse the researchers' minds. But, like you point out, we didn't stop the progress in time. After all, what you do is applied research. Our technique is far more effective against basic research. Speaking of basic research, how did your daughter die? The question silenced Yao for a few seconds. Wong noticed that her eyes dimmed almost imperceptibly. But she then resumed the conversation. Indeed, Compared to our Lord who possesses peerless strength, everything we do is meaningless. We are just doing whatever we can. Just as she finished speaking, several loud booms rang out, and the doors to the cafeteria broke open. A team of soldiers holding submachine guns rushed in. Wong realized that they were not armed police, but the real army. Noiselessly they proceeded along the walls and soon surrounded the rebels of the ETO. Chuchyong was the last to enter. 
His jacket was open, and he held the barrel of a pistol so that the grip was like the head of a hammer. Dasha looked around arrogantly, then, suddenly dashed forward, his hand flashed and there was the dull thud of metal striking against a skull. An ETO rebel fell to the ground, and the gun that he was trying to draw tumbled to fall some distance away. Several soldiers began to shoot at the ceiling, and dust and debris fell. Someone grabbed Wong Miao and pulled him away from the ETO ranks until he was safe behind a row of soldiers. Drop all your weapons onto the table. I swear I'm gonna kill the next son of a bitch who tries anything. Dasha pointed at the submachine guns arrayed behind him. I know that none of you is afraid to die, but we're not afraid either. I'm gonna say this up front. Normal police procedures and laws don't apply to you. Even the human laws of warfare no longer apply to you. Since you've decided to treat the entire human race as your enemy, there's no longer anything we wouldn't do to you. There was some commotion among the ETO members, but no one panicked. Yeah's face remained impassive. Three people suddenly rushed out of the crowd, including the young woman who had twisted Pan Han's neck. They ran toward the three-body sculpture, and each grabbed one of the spheres and held it in front of his or her chest. The young woman raised the bright metal sphere before her with both hands, as though she were getting ready to start a gymnastics routine. Smiling, she said, Officers, we hold in our hands three nuclear bombs, each with a yield of about 1.5 kilotons. Not too big, since we like small toys. This is the detonator. Everyone in the cafeteria froze. The only one who moved was Sha Chiang. He put his gun back into the holster under his left arm and placed his hands together calmly. Our demand is simple. Let the commander go, the young woman said. Then we can play whatever game you want. Her tone suggested that she wasn't afraid of Shu Chiang and the soldiers at all. I stay with my comrades, Ye yeah, said calmly. Can you confirm her claim? Dasha asked an officer next to him, an explosives expert. The officer threw a bag in front of the three ETO members holding the spheres. One of the ETO fighters picked up the bag and took out a spring scale, a bigger version of the one some customers brought to street markets to verify the portions measured by vendors. He placed his metal sphere into the bag, attached it to the spring scale, and held it aloft. The gauge extended about halfway, and stopped. The young woman chuckled. The explosives expert also laughed, contemptuously. The ETO member took out the sphere and tossed it on the ground. Another ETO fighter picked up the scale and the bag and repeated the procedure with his sphere, and ended up also tossing the sphere to the ground. The young woman laughed once more and picked up the bag herself. She loaded her sphere into the bag, hung it on the hook of the scale, and the gauge immediately dropped to its bottom, the spring in the scale having been fully extended. The smile on the explosives expert's face froze. He whispered to Dasha, Damn, I really do have one. Dasha remained impassive. The explosives expert said, We can at least confirm that there are heavy elements, fissile material inside. And we don't know if the detonation mechanism works. Mm -hmm. The flashlights attached to the soldiers' guns focused on the young woman holding the nuclear bomb. While she held the destructive power of 1.5 kilotons of TNT in her hands, she smiled brightly, as though enjoying applause and praise on a spotlit stage. An idea. Shoot the sphere. The explosives expert whispered to Dasha. Why would that set off the bomb? The conventional explosives around the outside will go off, but the explosion will be scattered. It won't lead to the kind of precise compression of the fissile material in the center necessary for a nuclear explosion. Dasha stared at the nuclear woman, saying nothing. How about snipers? Almost imperceptibly, Dasha shook his head. There's no good position. She thought his attack. As soon as she's targeted by a sniper scope, she'll know. Dasha strode forward. He pushed the crowd apart and stood in the middle of the empty space. Stop! The young woman warned Dasha, staring at him intently. Her right thumb was poised over the detonator. Her face was no longer smiling in the flashlight beams. Calm down, Dasha said, standing about seven or eight meters from her. He took an envelope from his pocket. 
I have some information you'll definitely want to know. Your mother has been found. The young woman's feverish eyes dimmed. At that moment, her eyes were truly windows to her soul. Dasha took two steps forward. He was now no more than five meters from her. She raised the bomb and warned him with her eyes. But she was already distracted. One of the two ETO members who had tossed away fake bombs strode toward Dasha to take the envelope from him. As the man blocked the woman's view of Dasha, he drew his gun with a lightning fast motion. The woman only saw a flash by the ear of the man trying to take the letter from Dasha before the bomb in her hands exploded. After hearing the muffled explosion, Wong saw nothing before his eyes but darkness. Someone dragged him out of the cafeteria. Thick yellow smoke poured out of the door and a cacophony of shouting and gunshots came from inside. From time to time, people rushed through the smoke and out of the cafeteria. Wong got up and tried to go back into the cafeteria, but the explosives expert grabbed him around the waist and stopped him. Careful! Radiation! The chaos eventually subsided. More than a dozen ETO fighters were killed in the gunfight. The rest, more than 200, including Yao and Xia, were arrested. The explosion had turned the nuclear woman into a bloody mess, but she was the only casualty of the aborted bomb. The man who had tried to take the letter from Dasha was severely injured, but since his body had shielded Dasha, his wounds were light. However, like everyone else who remained in the cafeteria after the explosion, Sha suffered severe radiation contamination. Through the small window of an ambulance, Wong stared at Dasha, who was lying inside. A wound on Dasha's head continued to ooze blood. The nurse who was dressing the wound wore transparent protective gear. Dasha and Wong could only talk through their mobile phones. Was that young woman's mother? Wong asked. Dasha grinned. Fucked if I know. Just a guess. A girl like that most likely has mother issues. After doing this for more than 20 years, I'm pretty good at reading people. I bet you're happy to be proven right. There really was someone behind all this. Wong forced himself to smile, hoping Dasha could see it. Play. You're the one who was right. Dasha laughed, shaking his head. I would never have thought that actual fucking aliens would be involved.